other day when, because I was like, I'm going to do a podcast where we don't talk about the comments section. I feel like comedians, it always comes up. And I was listening to one of your podcasts and you had such a poignant um, take on it where you, you know, like respond to people Mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about that and I was like, oh, because I just auto block comments. So I never have to see them and pretend they're not there. But then I'll do someone else's podcast, like Segura Burza, and then I'll just see the one that is big, you know what I mean? Or whatever, and how to keep that negativity out. But I think in the last, maybe it's just the pandemic or how few problems that, you know, you realize you have as you get older and you see what's going on in the world Mm -hmm. and that you have no right to complain Mm -hmm. about anything. Um, I realized I was like, you know what? I would actually rather be polarizing than just, I'd rather... If you like me, I want you to love me. If you don't like me, I want you to hate me. I've been doing that sometimes on purpose. I like because people are like, oh, you're so sweet and so funny and you're so blah, blah, blah. And so then sometimes I'm like, you never know what I'm doing. Like sometimes I'm just trolling stuff or things because people got real excited when I was like, oh, Outcast is better than the Beatles. People are like, oh, look at this guy. He's so progressive on the right side of the history. And then I made another tweet being like, oh, if you're going to a regular season baseball game and taking a day off work, you're probably a fucking loser. Why are you? <laughs> going to a regular season baseball game oh bad take bro baseball's great i'm like yeah i don't give a fuck either way yeah like i'm just saying stuff (laughs) but if there's this thing that happened where it's like comedians we're supposed to be dangerous we're supposed to say things that no one else will say where it's sort of like uh, 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 we're courageous for a living like you're coming to see like a delusional amount of confidence on a take and i always say like it's not our job to be right no ever or you know it's I, I think we say something that's like kind of indefensible and then we have to defend it with jokes and try to convince you. And at the end we might be like, oh, that didn't work, but we're taking you on like some journey. Yeah. And yeah. we don't have to be right. We're not scientists. We're not doctors. I think we all forgot that in the pandemic. Yeah. You poke holes at the truth. Yeah. You poke holes at things that you see mm-hmm. and you do you present your argument as like a, lo- like a lawyer or like anyone. But it's not my job to be the judge. It's not my job to go like this is right or this is wrong. Like, you know, if an audience isn't loving the joke, like, of course, I'll adjust on the thing. But like as far as, as being like, well, you have to. I think that's been a shift before. We've talked about this before, like a, a shift in how people have stopped writing to surprise and have started writing to be agreed with. Can I tell? And this is why I, I like miss doing stand up so much at either the comedy store or just like a club that has a lineup. You're on it, you know, Segura's on it, Rogan's on it, whoever's on it. Because um, when you're only performing to your fans, they're going to maybe give you a little like, going on stage when people are coming to see you and then me having to win them over, that's when you get good. There's this sort of epidemic of clapter happening where mm-hmm. someone will be like, you know, um, you know, so who voted for Biden? I was like, woo! Mm-hmm. And then it's like, yeah, fuck Trump, woo! And it's like, those weren't jokes. Mm-hmm. That was a, re- <laughs> this is now a rally. <laughs> like, woo! Is it? We're going for the involuntary laughter. And I And yeah. I must say, I remember a time at the improv where you went on stage and you you kill in a way that I just, I don't think, like you have to see you live. I mean, seeing you live, you kill in a way that's like frustrating. <laughs> like, because it's like, it the building shakes. I mean, you kill in a way that inspires me and I watch you perform and the way you surf the laughs and the way that you're so patient and let them come to you like you were just saying. And um, I just am curious if you always had that that cadence and that patience on stage. I sort of have like a desperation that I have to get to a thing and it's taken me so long to be able to let them come to me. Um, I think it's something that's been ingrained in me from like just issues as a child, you know, where I'm like, I moved around a lot. I moved around from Chicago to Oregon and stuff and, and just learning that like, I had to defend what I enjoy. I had been a you know, pro wrestling fan my whole life, and people were like, this is stupid. So I learned it very early on to be like, oh, I don't need you to agree with me. Like, I don't you, need you. You know what? You're in a company with a one Rick Rubin, easily the biggest music producer on the planet. All he watches is uh, wrestling. Yeah. So yeah. you're in good company. Of, yeah, I know. <laughs> Smart people love wrestling and 90 Day Fiance. <laughs> <laughs> and wrestling is so fascinating to me because it's oddly very feminist Mm -hmm. and it's fun to watch people fight without having to worry someone's gonna die thank you so much (laughs) that's all i've been trying to say (laughs) it's not like the nfl which is kind of just like fancy slavery at this point you know it's (laughs) it's like um you know it's like i don't have to i mean the nfl draft is just like 
uh, watching, you know, these men go up and get these pri- like it's just it just feels like um, MMA. I'm just like, oh, no. Yeah. Th- like that you might kill each other when they you're like, he's already down. You're hitting them some more. I like knowing they're friends at the end. They're not- just trying to put on a performance for me. And I'm not. Uh, worried that I'm participating in some CTE situation. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not, like, enabling some really... Well, sort of, wrestling's got its own thing with that from the past and things, so... The, but it's doing better now. The wrestlers that... Because they do choreograph it and orchestrate mm-hmm. it, right? Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of fun history. Just this past weekend, they had the very first two black women headline their biggest event of the year. Mm-hmm. Never happened before. I never thought I'd see it. And um, it did, and it was a great match, and they kicked ass. It was wonderful, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Sasha Banks. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have my own signature sneaker. Thank you. <laughs> what age did you first start watching it? Uh, like Hulk Hogan days? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, like uh, yeah, that's like my first. My uncle, because I you know grew up with just my mom, my sister, my aunt, house full of ladies, and my uncle would take me to in Chicago to Rosemont Horizon to go see WWF house shows and. I'd see Hulk Hogan and stretcher matches, the ultimate warrior. There's also something so, um, you know, there's this big conversation about toxic masculinity, which, you know, is is such a complicated topic to get into. But um, there it's pretty the guys are feminine. The women are masculine. Like, it's just very like the women are. I mean, just seeing such strong, muscular women, uh, you know, when I saw that and then men that were wearing little things that were kind of feminine and they were shiny and had long hair. There's a whole even bigger world going on right now. There's Sunny Kiss, and Sunny Kiss is amazing because Sunny Kiss wears straight up booty diva shorts, <laughs> identifies as whatever you want to call them, male, female, he, her, just says whatever you see me as is what I am, and okay. then just goes out there and kicks ass. This is amazing. And it's also comedy. Yeah. You know, they're trying to so make you fun. laugh. They're trying to like, we're, you know, we're joking. Have you mm-hmm. been out there? Have you been on tour at all since no, the I pandemic? No, I just started. I just booked some dates. I'm going to Salt Lake City in May. That'll Best. be my first one back out since um, Denver in November. So mm-hmm. I just, you know, they've been around here, did a couple of shows with you, did a, a couple, uh, did the Magic Castle parking lot show, yeah, yeah. which I was like, oh man, we've really fallen when we are begging to perform at the feet of magicians. <laughs> So dark, dude. So dark. That's not the, the the industry I knew. Do you like the car shows, which is like... No. I don't either. I don't like clackers. It's it against everything in my... Like, I've just been taught to hate honks or cl- clacking <laughs> or people yelling at me from cars of any nature. That's right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's like... it's like oh, I associate honks with, like, being catcalled, being... Mm-hmm. Ye- like, it's just such a uh, jarring uh, response instead of laughter. But I also did a bunch of... The, uh, sh- car shows when I was so desperate to mm-hmm. do something I was so afraid I was getting like so rusty at stand up or I would forget how to do it or something yeah. or um, be out of touch or whatever my a million fears were I was going to fall behind I'll, I can go on and on but when I did them I also felt like I was developing bad habits yeah. all these habits it's I worked with your timing all these habits I worked so hard to break. I started like yelling. I started going really fast. I get, was like doubting myself. It was just like I just it it really was not. Yeah, I had the same uh, fears and struggle, but I was like, first of all, I can't book uh, the driving gigs. I'm not, people aren't going to come see me for that like they would you or Bert. And secondly, I was like, at some point, I, at the, oh, I remember the points when I did some mushrooms, and then they told me to be nimble like a bunny. And I was like, hey, just fuck it. Like, you know, fuck it. Like, I'll if I'm rusty, I'll rusty. I'll get good again later. Like, and then I found out from not doing it for a few months and then doing it once, where I was like, "Oh, I'm actually kind of still good." Mm-hmm. And even in some ways, I'm like, I'm not necessarily better because I'm not in rhythm, but I'm like, "Oh, I feel more in the moment. I feel growth." So in some ways, I was like, "Oh, I'm happy that I feel." Me not doing it for like six, seven months. Like, I'm not even writing jokes. I'm not even doing anything. I'm just like, but I feel like it's probably going to extend my career by like 10 years because I got this break to just go and do voice acting, go and um, focus. I took some singing lessons, just acting classes, more more auditions and just being like, oh, that just, I'm not going to beat my head against the wall on that because even when I'm doing it, I'm not having fun. I'm scared. We take advantage. I, I, I just really think 
I was taking it for granted before. I was like, oh, I got to work on this joke. I got to work on this joke, you know, and and missing it a little bit mm-hmm. was because if you have a great joke, if you're not excited about it or grateful to be on stage, it's not going to kill the way that it should. Like, yeah. it's like it's just not fun. And it was also just then realizing w- w- reclaiming my power in that regard of like, like still having having real life fear of like, oh, what's gonna happen? What's what, what my life gonna be about? Am I gonna see my niece, you know, who I, you know was just born? And and I was like, oh, why do I give a fuck what Netflix thinks of me? Why do I give Dude. a fuck? Da, da, da. Oh, I I think about when you're twelve. Like you did everything. Like you got a special. You're on show. You did everything you wanted to do. So if you never get another special, fuck it. Fuck like it. just have fun and ever since i've been thinking about that it's been so much more fun for me because i'm not like worried about what other people are doing and it's hard to maintain i lose it well here's the thing i think i do think you know and and i want to talk about your podcast because you get really granular into the nitty-gritty about sort of mental health things and you know insecurities and things that a lot of people are afraid to share or or can't necessarily verbalize in an eloquent way and you have this incredible way of just saying something talking about either insecurities or you know you know um starting conversations about these really sticky mental health things that you know um you're just you're just brilliant at it um and uh, and I do feel like the only way I was able to really f- deal with my workaholism was because and constantly comparing ourselves to others, which is sometimes healthy. Like a healthy competition is good. Yeah. They did it. I can do it too. It's yeah. not like I'm the down. game. Yeah, it's just sort of like oh, like sometimes it drives you, and sometimes it's a liability and eats you alive and is unhealthy and you know a sick addiction to resentment and competition or whatever or this person doesn't deserve it or you start to get into that I deserve it whatever um but I do think that it I could only really face it and look at it when no one else was when everyone was on the bench yeah. because it's I, it was like we're all being like, okay we're all taking we're all not doing this no one's achieving anything right now great <laughs> like yeah. we can finally look at who we want to be and what do I actually want to talk about mm-hmm. when I'm not just trying to beat this person to a special? Like, what do I, who do I actually want to be when I'm not like, I gotta, I gotta go up three times this week or else people are going to think I'm not doing it. Like all my yeah. ego broke away. Yeah. It's one of the bit. I mean, you know, from do, doing tarot cards in the past, like there's a card I would get sometimes like about oppression and I would, and I'd be like, this fucking card sucks. And then, but then you'd read about it and be like, oh, there's positives to being oppressed. Um, you don't want to be oppressed for your life, but there's sometimes there's positive to be locked in place because mm-hmm. it forces you to like think your way out of things. It forces you to slow down. Because if you're locked in place, if you're like, fuck around you're gonna fucking break your shit you're gonna fuck yourself over by thrashing around you have to like calm down and really uh embrace whatever is going on in that moment to really just slow your mind down a bit and that's been what i've been trying to do while also at the same time being like um more aware of my value Mm, yes and not just take i i really i was talking with uh, Kristen, my assistant for government just about um I've reached this point in acting now that I reached in stand up before where I was like, oh, I can like, I can say no. I can not, I can say no to offers. Like before it was like, oh, like maybe I'll say no to an audition that I, I know I'm not going to so get. Lucky. But if you're offering it to me, yeah. oh, no way I'm saying no. And then if I say no, you're never going to ask me again. When in reality, the more you say no, the more they want yeah, you, which is so, you know, but it's all going to go away. My agent's not going to like me anymore. And they're not going to even, like, the fear that sets in saying no to a bad job that's not not even after scale <laughs> the fear that comes up yeah. uh how dare i you know by the time you pay your agent manager in taxes you're making you know 80 dollars, <laughs> and it's five days and you have to bring your own wardrobe and i say no and i'm like <gasps> everything's over everyone's gonna hate me the casting directors are gonna hate me how fast i go to that when in reality they're like good for her for yeah. passing on this <laughs> yeah she has self-respect all of a sudden when yeah. did that start i know well, it's gonna start for me next week. When, <laughs> I mean, the fact that you say, I mean, you work more than anyone. You're like the busiest person I know, even during the pandemic. And I want to ask you, uh, because the the big insecurity that set in during the pandemic for me of like, am I doing what everyone else is doing? Are people getting ahead or whatever insecure shit going on? Is social media like? How did your relation with social media change? Because I think I needed some time to be mm-hmm. forced to do IG lives and forced to take social media more seriously. Mm-hmm. Like, how did your relationship change? Um, it just was bringing a balance back to it because I think um, 
I was way too into it, especially when I was single and stuff and could just focus on, on working and that was it. And then when I got with my wife, who's very not into social media that much at all, I kind of- She can make a lot of money. Yeah, uh, she could. <laughs> That's why I tell her. You've <laughs> seen her. She <laughs> could be the biggest uh, influencer on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> she would eclipse Kim Kardashian real quick. She just one bikini photo <laughs> and you could retire, but whatever. <laughs> can I please manage her? <laughs> She's literally the hottest woman I've ever seen. <laughs> Thank you. She'll love hearing this. <laughs> but we're also, she's so kind and intelligent as well. Yeah, but her ass, though, is <laughs> yes! wild. It truly is. I mean, it is switches. It is so. It does. I watch it. Sometimes I carry it up the stairs <laughs> for her. It is... I'm like, this has got to be a load on you. I got to carry it. No, it you. is a legitimate caboose <laughs> but yeah we'll get back to your wife's body in a second and okay. i have a lot of questions about her sure. but i feel like we kind of blew past a couple things i'd like to dig into more um because you have so much wisdom you know in this area i'd like to talk about the tarot cards because i know nothing about tarot cards mm -hmm. and i'd like to talk about mushrooms because i've never done mushrooms in my life really mm -hmm. you seem like you've done all the drugs <laughs> because of my <laughs> Wait, okay in quarantine i did go a little off the rails i am um, I want to say like 15 days off of weed edibles because mm -hmm. they didn't work for like the I can do the babes. I just have to stop because then I I mean they just double edge because then I'm eating on top of it and then I, I wake up and I'm like oh I feel so chubby and I hate it and then I place another order so mm -hmm. I got I just compared to your wife's ass you are will always be minuscule. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just marry her so you could feel like a tiny little whis whisper of a thing? Yeah. <laughs> I'm the little spoon. You look anorexic <laughs> next to her ass. <laughs> like, how does she buy pants? Like, I'm not. I'm actually not joking. She. I mean, the times I've seen her, she's been in like a stretchy dress. That's and I'm, her general outfit. Because yeah. like she can't. What else could she wear? She struggles. Yeah, pants aren't. Poor right. thing. I feel awful for you. <laughs> um, well, she does get people fall. You know, the other day somebody followed her on her wall. You know, yelling at the car out at her, you know, just because uh, it happens. To be fair, <laughs> not to defend a cat caller, but I would definitely, I definitely have followed her a little bit just to be like, is that real? Like, I'm fascinated. And I was like, stop, stop. Bad, <laughs> bad Whitney, bad Whitney, bad. <laughs> so tell me about the mushroom experience. Like, what is the... Um, is it more to do like uh, like medicinally? Like, do you have a purpose going in, or is it more to kind of check out and be creative? It's a little bit of both. Um, basically, um, if you've never done mushrooms, it kind of feels I like I tried. I just it didn't. I did like LSD, like I think that's like different. Tabs when I was like eleven. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't do drugs. I mean, I do LSD, <laughs> like just tabs from strangers in Delaware. I'm just out there. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just like doing a check-in for myself. The best way I could describe it is that, like, I feel like my regular life is that I'm a you know rat in a little maze. And then when I do mm. mushrooms, sometimes a little hand comes out, grabs me by my collar, pulls me up so I can see where the exit is and see wow. where all the cheese is and not be afraid of everything. And then it lets me go and drops me back in and I have to try to remember those things. Um, so it's like, I don't try to do it too much, but I've had so many wonderful experiences from from doing mushrooms. I, um, do you do about, alone or with someone? Usually with people, uh, sometimes alone. The last one, because I see with the, the last one, yeah, I was just in my house at two in the morning, uh, locked in my office so I wouldn't scare my wife, even though she she eventually found out because I started stumbling around. Imagine if you hallucinated on mushrooms and her butt got bigger. <laughs> 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 I mean, that would be, be for it. <laughs> okay, now you're getting greedy. <laughs> but I ask because this, I actually have an insecurity uh, with you. Uh, when I came on the show Undateable, mm -hmm. that uh, you obviously were on, and I came on like as a guest, it was like such a weird experience. But um, uh, I was like so insecure the whole time. And, and you know, when you go into someone else's show and everybody's friends and everyone's got a thing and you come on and you like, you know. Um, are like trying to be friends with everyone or trying to, you like don't know any of the inside jokes and yeah. you're just sort of like don't know the drill and yeah. you're the outsider or whatever. And um, and I think it was like after show or something and you had smoked some weed and I was like, are you stoned? Like I was such a dork and you were like, yeah. And I was like, oh, what's the high leg? And you're like, well, you're kind of ruining it. Like, <laughs> 
people like it's not fun anymore and I was like oh like I was just like trying to talk to you and be like what's your high like man and you were just like dude please stop and I was like oh okay got it like of course <laughs> um, because I'm so fat I, I would like to be able to uh, learn how to chill out and not be so manic and you know I'm just trying to find a way to different strokes different yeah. folks though like man, if you try it and you don't love it it's not for you, but because I've never tried to force, you know, I'm ugh, be like Cheech or Chong. Which one was it? <laughs> Chong? Yeah, Chong's one always that... like, smoke everybody, smoke weed, <laughs> even babies. I'm like, even babies? I... <laughs> <laughs> I heard they don't get along or talk. I could see that. I love that I'm just starting shit. Like, just like. I don't know that either one, but I met, I met one of them and, and I could see not getting along with them. I I remember I I wrote on that. Do you remember TBS did a roast of Cheech and Chong? Mm -hmm. And I remember Ralphie Mae went up and killed so hard and was so funny. But there was like a scrap between him and I think one Cheech, or, like it got real. Mm -hmm. Like a roast is never supposed to get real. It's mm -hmm. like, we're all joking. We're doing this for money. Like you get it. Just, a you know, and it got he did for real because I think the one thing was don't come after Ralph, Ralphie's weight or something and someone did and you know it was just um it, well that seems like a, that like you can't call that one hmm. there's a lot of things you could call <laughs> but you can't be like well we can't talk about your weight that's crazy like, <laughs> I, I, I might be he's like we're playing baseball I, but you can't use the bat <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Man, you rest in peace, a legend, but he was a part of Harvey it. Harvey Weinstein's on the roast. You're not allowed to talk about rape at all. No. <laughs> so, action. What? Yeah, well, it was, it, everyone has their own thing that they come with that is off limits, but it's usually the person being roasted. Like David Hasselhoff, it was, you can't come after. Uh, well, uh, was it the thing about the burger? Was that him? No, uh, that was definitely him. Okay. What was David Hasselhoff's? Uh, I th I think. Well, Hulk Hogan was there, and he said, "I'll only do it if you don't talk about my daughter," mm. which I thought was badass. Uh, uh, Shatner was don't talk about his dead wife who drowned in his pool. That seems appropriate. That seems <laughs> that's different. Oh, we went so hard at it. <laughs> um, and then. Uh, uh, Tommy Lee on Pam Anderson wrote, says you can't talk about the dead kid in the pool because mm. there is a t like uh, it's usually like tragedies like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Snoop Dogg was like you can't talk about my arrest. Like I mean, usually it's stuff like that, and every now and then someone will come with something that's like okay, we can't not like Bob Saget saying don't talk about the Olsen twins. It was like okay, that's cute. Uh, you know, it's like it's trying to find that line of you know, are people going to be distracted by not bringing up this elephant in the mm -hmm. living room, and how do we do it in a way that's not uh, hurting them, but still honoring your request, or then we'll just cut it out later or whatever. But I remember that was someone crossed the line and it got it got real, and that's so interesting to me when comedians, where all we do is you know um, uh, roast each other all day, and then you get your feelings hurt all of a sudden. There's all yeah. you realize oh, well, where I'm over for that. I'm a person. I'm sensitive. That's because I'm an actor too. I gotta be sensitive, uh, and I just I get that I, because. If I don't respect you, mm. if I don't respect you in your comedy, then I definitely don't want you saying something about me. I think yeah. those are the things that are missing some of the times, right? When you're just getting random people. And it's like, I, I didn't come up with you. I don't. Yeah. And it's not like yeah. I have to come up with you. Yeah, you don't know me like that. I don't know you for you to be talking to me like that. Yeah. Like, you know? Yeah. And so I get that. That's why my, you know, issue. You no, know, but I've, I've softened because I've, I've just never been a big fan of the roast. Because I was like, oh, I like these old Dean Martin roasts. Well, but like, oh, they didn't really know each other that well either. So that's fine. Well, and you did a show that was like kind roasting mm -hmm. yeah which is true yeah which is such a cool take like such a fresher take i think it was just made it fun yeah. and it's harder it makes people to work different muscles of their mind which i'm always pro because it's just easy. i mean just all you know simple it's yeah. easier to destroy than create so. yeah and you just can't go for the low-hanging fruit which is like i feel like we're at a time where it's like time to like cut it out with the low-hanging fruit like that Easy shit. You That's know? what I'd like to talk about. What do you think? Because we talked about before people writing to be agree with. What do you think's coming new? Because I think it is feeling good for me because I feel like people want to get silly again. <laughs> and that's when I shine. Well I, <laughs> well, I think that your comedy is 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 like, um, you know, they say the one stock that never 
uh, is affected by the economy or anything that's going on in the news is Krispy Kreme. <laughs> <laughs> Swear to God. Like, it just always is, like, solid. Like, you, to me, I, I don't feel like, to me, c- mean comedians in the last four years, people are just not into because there was so much meanness all the time on Twitter and with our president, and you would just constantly see nastiness. So mm-hmm. I do think your comedy, you know, was a respite in that time. But I also think now people can go, you know, see a comedy show and just be silly and not be like, we need to, you know, change the world in this next two hours, yeah. you know? Um, but I, I, it's interesting because I, I feel like this last four years, you know, someone like me, like th- there is a thing where you're like, okay, what's my responsibility right now with a platform? Like what, should I be more political? Should I, do, does anyone want to hear from me? Like, I, I think I, I just, I get a little fraught with that. I think mm. just with the last four years, there's mm-hmm. this little bit of like, do I need to teach? Should my, do I need to like tell stories that help change people's minds about things? You know, like I, I feel a little bit of like mm-hmm. pressure to say more sometimes or, or. I could understand that with you because you, that's, you're in a, pri- people consider a privileged position. Mm-hmm. So then you feel a weight to that. Um, I was feeling a little bit, not necessarily a weight, it was just a change. I'm like, like, oh, I'm becoming a different comedian. And I was like, oh, what? It's kind of that similar story. And then my friend Gabe, he was like, uh, he just gave me the best advice. And now that's where I've been, my focus is. He's like, I was like, oh, I just don't feel like, you know, I'm getting older. My son's going to be 18. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about having another kid and, and all these things. And I'm like, I, I don't feel like I, I can't sell this, like, pothead, da 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 <laughs> And she he was like, you never, that's not what you sold. Yep. You're like, you're not selling. He goes, you sell being yourself. You sell being free. He's like, you sell f- freedom is your, is, is, is your style. And I'm like, oh, that open my mind more where I was just like oh, I could just say whatever the fuck I want because that's what I'm supposed to do and I think especially at this time when it's supposed to be either I'm supposed to be worried about being murdered by police or mm-hmm. I'm supposed to uh, if I'm not worried about it I should be out there protesting mm-hmm. about it um, I, you know, I'm doing the Chop 420 show and I had a lady reach out to me and be like how dare you host this show while our brothers and sisters are locked in jail for marijuana and I was like don't you get don't you get that that's what this show's supposed to make mm. you feel is like how ridiculous that not that I shouldn't have a show mm-hmm. is that these laws shouldn't be like that if this is going on this is ridiculous mm-hmm. it's stupid and that's what I'm selling you the dream of that future you want so why the fuck are you yelling at me yeah and p- there, so many people are in so much pain right now and I don't know how I'd behave in, be behaving if I was just a fan on social media. Like, yeah, oh, that's so true. I, I, so I'm true. sure I'd be like, you need to fuck this post. I'm sure I would be the biggest troll on the planet if I wasn't a public yeah, person. No, I forget that sometimes. <laughs> I had to delete a thing because I had another, like, oh, <laughs> the thing, uh, retweet something about Charles Barkley and this, like, tw- I bet she's a fan of you. She might be watching this podcast. Uh, this white lady. <laughs> <laughs> this <laughs> white lady. <laughs> <laughs> this t- t- 20-ish, 30-ish white lady just was like, J- he's on the... Because he was just basically like being like, quit being so Republican-Democrat when they're both selling uh, against our best interests. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to look at a bigger thing. And then she was like, he's doing this, you know, both sideism. Oh, he's being basically being an Uncle Tom. And I was like, oh, first of all, you can't say that. Uh, You're a white lady. You can't call anybody Uncle Tom. I'm not going to accept that. Not even your Uncle Tom. No. So he, he has to change his name <laughs> yeah. to Jim. He's Uncle Jim now. Switch it Uh-oh, up. Too close to Jim Crow. He's Uncle Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> and then secondly, it's just a thing where go like, it took me a step back to go like, oh, wait, like, why do I in- engage with some of these things when people just mm-hmm. are fucking stupid? Or they're committed you know, they're not committed to changing their minds. Like, they, they're not interested yeah. in changing their minds. And I, I think that happens a lot when people are in fear. You know, they say that um, when you're in fear, your IQ level goes down, like, 10 points. We yeah. actually get stupider when we're scared. Like, yeah. in the pandemic, we just saw it happen. People were scared of dying, and they just got dumber. You just bought toilet paper. And I, yeah, <laughs> totally. And it's interesting because comedians, like, it's kind of, I don't, in, in, like, I'm so insecure. Maybe it's an insecurity thing. Like, I want to be wrong like because then you're not if you're right already like 
you know everything. Mm -hmm. Like you know, like you're just done learning. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so wild to me that you know people are just like, nope, I got it. My point of views are stuck forever. This is what I believe, yeah. and I'm only going to look for the things that reinforce my own beliefs. Yes, and malign anyone that you know disagrees with me. Yeah, and leave with all emotion with no fact when it's just like you're a prisoner of that moment over one thing that Charles Barkley said to the point that you would call him Uncle Tom when it's like, well, like, do you know how he's donated millions to black colleges? Do you know how he's done also, even civil if he rights? Hasn't. Yeah, even if doesn't he even matter even what he's he hasn't. done. You're absolutely right. Literally, even if he hasn't. But it's like, you're such an idiot that to even bring that, like you're but you're on the wrong side. You're you're fighting against your own allies. But what makes me what fascinates me about that is I'm like you truly like you put this in writing like you <laughs> you have so many you ran that by a couple bit like who in your life is allowing you like who's where like I mean obviously where are you getting your news whatever but it's so fascinating to me but I think that what we're f leaving out of this conversation and this whole moment is the conversation about addiction and i know i talk about addiction so much because i identify as an addict and i have so much addiction in my life but self-righteous indignation is a true addiction you know getting dopamine off of sending a tweet mm -hmm. and getting a response mm -hmm. and the adrenaline of ron funch is responding to me and me pissing him off like a lot of people crave that drama we get adrenaline every night doing stand-up like for a lot of people sending a dm to you and getting a response that's that's their madison square garden mm -hmm. you know and and it's it's really sick and I try to stay judgmental about it but I also try to stay back and just go how are you getting I don't understand how you're getting pleasure out of this but but adrenaline makes dopamine like what are we going to do moving forward just knowing this is our human nature and the way we're wired as people like mm -hmm. we used to sit around the Roman Colosseum and watch people just get torn apart like <laughs> we are inherently a very savage species even though we sort of have to stand in line and, and be nice to each other at coffee shops but like as soon as we're behind a computer it's all of a sudden you know when there's anonymity See, this is why I call you Ho Rogan <laughs> I talk about you just, uh, neuroscience. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, at the core of it, we're just savages. We were just savages waiting in line at the grocery store. <laughs> oh it's so true. It is so true. I actually think I have more shit on my desk than Rogan does <laughs> by some weird miracle. Um, but because so, <laughs> I I'm just always trying to figure out like this this binary thinking terror management. This is so ho Rogan. <laughs> Yeah, now I cannot say anything. God damn it. All right, I'm going to start talking about Gavin Newsom. Let's get into Gavin Newsom. Fuck that guy. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, but I, I do, like, Sarah Silverman used to have this, or I'm, she, I don't know if she still does it, this joke about um, pro-life people mm -hmm. and how much they care about babies. The irony is, like, if we're protesting pro-choice and pro-life right next to each other, we're actually the same person. You just have the wrong info. You know what I mean? Like you want to go out and say babies. Like so would I if a baby was being murdered. Like I, you know. But we just have different definitions or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the irony is like it's just we actually have so much in common. We're just operating under different facts. Yeah, I mean that's just crazy we to think about. Find out though um, when we can go back and travel, right? Like that's. When, when you're on Twitter, it feels so isolated. Mm -hmm. and it feels so like, oh, people are thinking. But then you go out, mm -hmm. like one of my favorites performed, Fayette, uh, Fayetteville, Alabama, or uh, Ar Fayetteville, Arkansas, or um, what's the place in Alabama? Huntsville. Huntsville. Huntsville oh, yeah, Alabama. yeah. The Dome, the Star Dome. I don't remember the name. Mm -hmm. But I love the city. Yeah. Because so then good. you go really go like, oh, fuck, actually, America's really fun sometimes. Where you go to Huntsville and you're like, oh, there's people and I'm sure there's issues. I'm sure there's racism and all these things. But, like, it's a lot more of this togetherness than mm -hmm. we see. And then, um, you know, everything out here is just all isolated, isolated and, and fighting against each other. I've just never been, I can never get into that. I've always been like, hey, if you're on whatever side of the box you're on, you're holding up the fucking box. Yeah. So why are you, what, what are you doing? But I think we all, it's like our fundamental human need, and tell me if I'm wrong, because you just, I, I see you as like an expert in like mental health. Like, is our- That's not true. I know, but- <laughs> But here's what I'll say. No one's an expert in mental. Like, it's if you talk about it a lot and ask a lot of questions, you're an expert. Like, to me, I've heard some things on your podcast that are more incisive and, and eloquent and have helped me look at myself 
in different ways and uh, have compassion for other people uh, more than any therapist I've talked to or a program. I, just because you're asking the right questions and you're fearless about talking about things that are uncomfortable or, you know, especially that I haven't seen a lot of men mm. say, you Thank know, you. really, um, I don't want to say brave. I hate calling people brave. It's like when you call uh, a woman brave, it basically just means like they look old and yeah. they're not wearing it's makeup. Just open. I'm just open to yeah. it. Yeah. And it's so, um, the op, it's so, uh, badass in a way you know because it's like the one thing I think a lot of men are afraid to talk about is their feelings and like that there's something just so um you know just cool about it and um and all my the guys that I date I we listen to it in the car and show them like this is cool this is funny like this isn't bitch mm -hmm. you know um yeah I mean to me it's always opposite the other way is super bitch to, like that's so bitch like, to be like I never, I'm not gonna tell you about my feelings yeah. like you're or, or a bitch to be like, I don't have feelings yeah. you, couldn't, you can't hurt my feelings <laughs> I don't have any and it's like all right you little bitch all right for real the most badass shit you can say is I'm scared yeah I'm insecure I'm scared. you hurt my feelings I don't feel comfortable right now yeah like I don't I, I don't feel, feel safe uh, yeah, just saying that's the that's strength. That's um, from a young age. I think it's from my mom and stuff. It's just like, to me, true strength is like not going like you can't hurt me. Is yeah. it's going? Oh, you hurt me. That did hurt. And guess what? Yeah. I'm still going to be loving. I'm still going to be open. I'm still going to um, come out there and, and expect nice things to happen to me, even though you hurt me. That's strong to mm -hmm. me, as opposed to being like, oh, I got hurt once. It's always usually just one guy got hurt by one girl when he was a fucking teen. And then he's like, well, now I just don't feel any feelings and mm -hmm. fuck these bitches and I don't talk about anything. And it's just like, you're a weak fucking child. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking grow up and be yeah. an adult and say what fucking bothers you. Yeah. Not also, just, she was a bitch. Yeah, that's she fine. She was a fucking cunt. Let's that be honest. Happens. <laughs> Women are cunts. Yeah, for real, for real. <laughs> Truly, they will try to eat your soul sometimes. It's just that's um that's really fascinating to me, and I I'm curious about your strategies about how you when to internalize someone when someone hurts you, uh, and when to not. So for me, I tend to take everything way too personally, mm -hmm. which is a form of narcissism, really, to assume <laughs> that everyone's running around trying to hurt you. Yeah. Like, they, it's usually by accident, you know? It's usually just sort of you're a casualty of their own insecurities or fears or whatever, and you, I spend the whole day having my feelings hurt when I'm like, hey, that hurt my feelings, and they're like, what? I wasn't even talking to you. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I make it bigger than it is. But sometimes it's good to nip, just find that out, right? Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. Are, what mountains out of molehills are, mm -hmm. are we making? But other times, I will dismiss bad behavior and have denial around it and excuse the behavior. Like when do you excuse it and go, oh, they're just sick and suffering or oh, they're just in pain. Oh, I'm projecting and you know, mm. like how oh, do you- When it causes you mental or physical harm, I feel, or when it affects you in any negative way, just having boundaries. Mm. That's like one of the biggest mantras I've found because I used to be just like oh i'm like oh we'll figure it out like no one's evil mm. no one's in. and it's like well no one can be has to necessarily be evil but you can you no know, one has to be a bad person but you can be bad for me mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. like you can be good for somebody else you could be great for somebody else mm -hmm. but you're bad for me mm -hmm. and so i can't have you around and that's where the boundary is for me is just knowing I, even in all relationships i have i just try to keep people at a distance to where I can love you. <laughs> and, like, and, you know? and in a healthy kind of love. And uh, and uh, that's so interesting, but it also helps me to know, like, because I tend to go, like, you make me feel this way. You, you're doing this or you're doing this. And then I find that I can really figure out if someone's healthy for me, not based on what they're doing, because mm -hmm. I can be very dysmorphic and I can hallucinate and I can project and I can minimize and dramatize and rationalize. It's more now I'm at a point where I know, okay, I know if someone's bad for me, based on how I'm behaving. Am mm -hmm. I making myself small? Am I being unctuous? Am I complimenting them? Or am I giving them gifts that they don't need? Am I buying them expensive candles? Like their behavior, I'll never be able to mm -hmm. really decipher because I'm just too, yeah. my vision's too cloudy. But if I start like, you look so pretty, blah, or trying to not do be they funny. Feel you, do they make you feel shit like that? Or do they make you feel open? And they make you, Am I trying too hard? make you feel okay to be naked? Mm. Like, you know, that's one thing with my wife, one thing, because she was super hot, so I was saying, but she, when I, when she looked at me, I'm like, she made me feel like I'm fucking, you know, the hottest thing walking. She didn't make you feel insecure. Yeah. One tool that does work for me, which because I really struggled with my default being at war with people, 
Um, I did, and I got a tattoo. It's a white tattoo, so not a lot of people can see it right here. Is I just say I love you to someone. Every like I go through the hallway in the comedy store, and anyway, I love you. Like I have to say it in my head over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, and I also find myself if someone hurts my feelings, I try to ask them three questions about themselves. <laughs> I know it's a contrary action I have to do uh, just to get to know them a little better. Like, where are you from? Like, are your parents still together? And then I'll learn something that's like, okay, got it. You're, you're hurt too. Hurt people, hurt people. Got it. And I'll just, I'll be able to detach and not take it personally because it's not about me. This person didn't go out of their mm. way to be like, I'm going to go hurt Whitney today. They hurt a lot of people, you know, um, through their life. That seems like you looked so deep into it. I'd be like, I'd just be like, I had one just recently where uh, someone just brought me this like job opportunity, and then like the the company was like, uh, like I didn't respond in a couple. Like I just said, yeah, and then I went about my business, mm -hmm. and then they were like, oh, we haven't been able to get a hold of you in a couple of days. You don't seem interested. Da, 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 da. And so then I reached out to my friend, and I was like, well, do you know about this? And he was like, oh yeah, they were. Done. I was like, why didn't you tell me that they were having? issues about it and then you know, I was like so then I was just like I let it go from it but I go you know what I go I just had to let you know I feel like if you were actually my friend you would have fought for me a little bit you hmm. would have told them how professional I am hmm. you would have told them uh how good how much of a value mm -hmm. I am because they don't even know you know it's like they think that I'm just some they thought I was just some twitch streamer they don't know I'm on movies and tv yeah, yeah. shows and shit you know and so it's like well, in my head, they wanted you so bad they offered it to you and then followed up three days later. That's what I would think. You know, but they didn't. And so it was just the thing of being like, I just want to let you know this hurt my feelings, and mm. I feel like, I mean, you, you probably don't feel the same way, but mm. are you thinking? And he was like that. It was like, oh, you know, I just didn't think about it, or why? When would I have told you? And I was just like, I just know like how I look at friendship. That if someone was like, oh, we're having a problem with your friend, I would be like, text right away. Yeah. You know, just because like, like, it was me and you or something. Yeah. I'd be like, what's going on, Whitney? Oh, I would do. You I'd know? go, hey, dude, just FYI, we haven't heard back. Like, I, if you don't want to do it, it's fine. But just yeah. like, let us know. I don't want, yeah. you know, but also it's like, you know, and the flip side of that is be authentic and be yourself. And if I write back, yeah, and you take it as a no, what's going on with you? Yeah. I don't even think I want to work with you. Yeah, like, you that's know, we what don't, it turned out. We that... don't speak the same language and we both speak English. Yeah, and I was like, you know what? I'm not enthusiastic anymore. You're right. Yeah. You turned out to be quite right. You projected onto my curt email, which yes, a yes is a yes. And I'm, I'm learning more and more as I get older. Like, you can speak the same language and completely speak different languages. Like, I have people in my life and it's taken me so long to stop trying to change the way I am to try to get them to understand because they're just committed to not. But when you're, you know, in relationships and you're like, look, I was just, you know, or friendships even, when you're like, look, that really hurt my feelings. Like, oh, so I'm a bitch. And you're like, mm. didn't say that. Mm -hmm. Didn't say that. You mm -hmm. said that. And we're just not able to communicate for whatever reason. Well, usually what that is, right, is that immediate reaction to like, oh, I did something wrong and mm -hmm. I don't want to feel like I did something wrong. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to turn it around right away. And it's, not, you know, and you got to, um, you know, it's something that you, on a lesser extent, me and my wife still struggle with of just knowing how to communicate with each other when we're both triggered about you're always things. staring her ass while she's trying to <laughs> communicate with you. <laughs> Often, or I'm not paying attention. Like, if you or, just turn around and say it to me. One of her main things, you know, I'm a messy, I'm a messy person. And How so? Like with your... I just leave shit everywhere. Mm -hmm. I, leave shit, I leave a trail What's wherever your job I to go. clean it up? What's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> What's the confusion? <laughs> <laughs> and then you know she would just take it personally and yeah. i'd be like you know like i'm no i'm not like hey you're my slave and you gotta pick up after me mm. i just literally don't think about this yeah and so if you have a problem with it just go hey go pick it up because you know she would be just leave it for a couple days mm -hmm. and then be like i'd leave it for more days <laughs> <laughs> she she well I've done that a lot where you kind of like leave it there to be like oh he'll eventually get to it I'm not I don't want to set the precedent that I'm going to clean it up but then it doesn't work no, <laughs> and then it does you just, not. you're like I'm expecting him to read my mind in that moment um okay so I always ask this to especially comedians that are in super healthy relationships because there are let's be honest you know kind of few just few healthy relationships I think in general but um why her I know why but why her? I've met her. I, I, I get why. But, you know, when, um, you know, I think a big part of this podcast is we talk about red flags. We talk about why things work. And, and uh, when someone's in a successful relationship, I just want to mine every piece of wisdom they have. And uh, why her? When was the moment you were like, it's her? She always seemed to really be attracted to me when I was kind. And uh. she always um, just didn't like it when I wasn't. 
Mm. And I was like, that is someone I want to be around. It's someone who makes me want to work better. And be the be, best version of myself yeah. and encourages the best parts of me, mm -hmm. you know? And believes in me and truly, like, you know, she'll get, work with my diet for me and stuff like that. Cause she's like, you are, she's like, yeah, you're a leading man. You're a fucking leading man. And they're going to figure, they'll figure it out. I know it. You know it. They'll figure it like out. Like I picked you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like right? I could have been with anyone. Yes. So. <laughs> I mean, truly. Truly. No, and she'll tell me because we'll get in arguments. Like sometimes I'll forget and I'll get like that. And I go, oh, you only want, you like the, you like the act. You like the, you don't like the part of me that's weird and, and gets anxious and, uh, you know, can fly off the handle a little bit. And, and she's like, no. And she's like, if I wanted to be, she's, you don't think I could have gotten another fucking comedian? She's like, in a fucking <laughs> heartbeat? <laughs> you don't think Dane Cook's not outside my house right now? Uh, that is fascinating. What are some red flags that that are that are absolute bottom lines for you? Absolutely not. Um, if you want to think about it for a second, let me know. Okay. I mean, I could just talk about things that come up. I just don't like it when people aren't, you know, classic ones. People aren't kind to, like, if you're on a date and people aren't kind to the way stuff. That's a huge. That's, like, number one red flag for me. I went on my first vacation with the guy that I'm dating right now this past weekend. And not only, because this was the first date we've ever been on. We've, it's the first time we've been out to dinner because mm. of the pandemic. Mm. But we've been dating for eight months. Mm. So I've never seen him, on, you know. And, uh. And not only was he so kind to the, like, would say, oh, hey, Janine, how are you? So, like, not only so kind, but also flirted with the older waitresses, mm -hmm. which I love. Mm -hmm. She's like, you look beautiful. Too. Like, I just, it made me so, it was such a relief. I was like, this is, like, so much more important than sex to me. It's so much more important than anything else. And not only that, but also flirting with the older ones. Yeah. It's no, so it's hot fun. to Makes me. Makes it fun. Yeah, you got a little competition. Yeah, yeah. But you could win. But it's like, a, but it's like, a, <laughs> it's like a, okay, I wasn't feeling that threatened. <laughs> well, kind of everything threatens me, but it was like to to flirt with the older ones and sort of like you know be charming. It was just so cool to watch. No, I, I like mean it. I killed her after, but it was you know it was sweet. He like made her day, you know. That's a great one. Uh, How you treat wait staff is huge. If people are super drunk, I mean these are things that I learned by going through them. Like you know, I had a girl show up like drunk to a date, and I was like, this is not ideal. Not ideal. Yeah, exactly. You I, think it? Sometimes you think I was it's gonna say be before ideas. me too. That was a I that thought was it a was my pussy. And you're like this isn't good. No, um, certainly not on a first date. And and people who just don't expect to be treated nice you run into that a lot in LA I think especially our, when I was dating in my 30s and stuff you just ran into people who are just always like even my wife we have we tell this story like I took I think it was our third date and I just took her to this restaurant and I was like oh it's going well and I go like I think this date's going well I'm just gonna come out and ask it and she just was like <gasps> and I was like do you want to go on another date and yeah. she <laughs> it just I, it just depends on if we're gonna split it or not. Are we gonna go on another date? After? She, yeah, she, but she was like, "No, I thought for sure you're gonna be like, well, it's our third date. We gotta go have sex." Or I went on a oh, date. Oh, go on another date and not sleep together. Yeah, I was just like, "I'm having fun. Let's have another date." You know. Aww. Um, which, you know, there's times for I'm like, we're just hanging out and that's mm -hmm. that. But if, if I'm looking for a relationship, looking for a person to be with, like, yeah, let's just chill. And if, if someone's always expecting to I mean, um, that's the thing. I know some people don't like her Coachella views, but I worked with Vanessa Hudgens on Powerless. And that was one thing I took from her when I worked because I remember opening the door for her on set just because like, you know, that's what I would do. And just the way she walked through, she said thank you, she said thank you, but she never broke stride. She never once expected that door not to open for her. Oh, that, yeah. Yep. You know? Yeah. And I like I like that in a woman. That's I like that when a woman, be like, you go, you will treat me nicely. And I think there's this, this struggle I see with the youngins about, like, I'll open my own door. I can open my... No, I know you mm -hmm. can open it. No mm -hmm. one thinks you're handicapped and are not capable of opening a door. That's not... Because I used to kind of be like that. Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to pay for everything. I'm going to do... I like, like, I'm an independent woman. And it's sort of like, no, true power means... You can allow, you can receive love. You can receive acts of service mm -hmm. and not be keeping score in your head. Yeah. Because I always uh, was so suspicious and I would interpret them as a manipulation. And if you're strong, I'm weak or you're implying that I can't do something. Yeah. Which is coming from a place of like total insecurity. And, and as you're talking about um, uh, this, it, it reminds me of a piece of advice that I loved that I heard, which is that insecure people are dangerous. Hmm. And I think sometimes our instinct with insecure people is to pity them, feel bad for them, 
but someone else's insecurity is their problem to solve. Mm -hmm. If you're in, there's something about insecurity where people are like, I'm insecure, I'm insecure. It's like, go fix it. If you're so insecure, go to therapy, go to, the, you know, AA, al -Anon. There's so many opportunities to fix mm -hmm. this, but it's no one else's fault and it's your problem to solve. Just because yeah. you admitted it doesn't mean we all have to accommodate it. Oh yeah, no, I'm very, you know, sensitive and, and, and uh, if you're dealing with mental issues or illness of any type, I'm always in your corner, but I've never been thinking of like, I will never let someone's issues allow, give them an excuse to harm me. Yeah. Like you can feel however you want to feel, you can be insecure, you can be whatever, but if you if that is what's causing you to harm me, then I gotta cut you out until you figure yourself out. I'm not gonna hang around and wait for you to figure this out. That's not what I'm here for. And frankly, me being here is probably enabling it and mm -hmm. making it worse for you, but I think that I've been thinking about this a lot because I've had my feelings hurt a lot recently and I've seen a lot of people on social media do stuff that's like upset me or piss me off or whatever. And I'm really trying to delineate, you know, the difference between intention and impact. Mm. And the guy that I'm dating does not let me get away with anything. It's very annoying. But he always says to me, like, because I'm like, well, that's not what I meant. He's like, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You're 38 years old. Mm -hmm. Your intention doesn't really matter here. Your mm -hmm. impact matters. Mm -hmm. The first couple I like him. He seems good. <sighs> Fuck, it's such a nightmare. Yeah, he... Um, yeah, he's like, cut that shit out. Like, yeah. he doesn't let anything slide. Like, I mean, I'll, cause I, look, my dad was a lawyer. Like, you know, we're comics. Like, we can pretty much get anything over mm -hmm. on anyone. We can manipulate. We can win. Mm -hmm. We can charm. We can charm. We can beguile. Mm -hmm. We can bully. We can say something in observation about you will, that will change the way you see yourself forever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and this is the first relationship I think I've been in where, as soon as we're arguing, we're on the same side. And it's like, I'm not fighting with you, I'm fighting for you. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time I've been in a relationship where I just pipe, bite my tongue and it's like, if I win, we both lose. Like, I, even when I, win, I, when I win, I don't feel good, I feel bad. Mm -hmm. You know, and in mm -hmm. relationships before, I was like, I won, yes. You won, you were out to destroy. He respects me or like, I'm, you know, and it's like, wait, that is so sick and unhealthy. That is yeah. such a, a a damaging philosophy. But um, he, he'll all just do something and he's like, does that work for you? <laughs> <laughs> like he literally would just be like, Are you, oh, you're doing that thing where you go into a generalization and then you use your arms to try to distract. He's like, okay, <laughs> let me know when you're done. Like he just has no uh, patience for it mm -hmm. and doesn't entertain it. Yeah, well, my wife and I are very much the same in that. And um, I think because we just have similar backgrounds and been through similar traumas to where like we just notice each other's triggers and she'll, and she'll be, for a lot of other people, like, you know, I think I, I would have these red flags and just be like, oh, you know, you, you showed me something, so I'm going. And then um, my wife would be like, no, you're, this isn't about me. Mm. You're freaking out about something else. Yeah. Um, if it's I'm hysterical, gonna, it's historical. Yeah. You go figure it out. You calm down and you talk to me later. And, and, um, and, and I try to do that with her. Sometimes she don't listen to that. But... <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry that we now have to take a break in this delightful train of joy, charm, and love. Frankly, sexual chemistry, let's be honest. Everyone can feel it. Um, to talk about better help. That's because, why I need it, because of sexual chemistry. Yeah, I was saying, <laughs> because if I want to land a man like Ron Funches, I'm going to have to get my shit together <laughs> You're going to need better help. <laughs> Is there something interfering with your happiness? Or Don't even you? ask. Because <laughs> the answer is yes. And it's me. <laughs> you can start communicating with a BetterHelp counselor in less than 48 hours. That's can insane. I, can I tell you something? By the time I'm like, I need a therapist, like calling to schedule, and they're like, you can come in two weeks. Like, I've already made the bad decision. I've already snorted the Adderall. 100%. I've already you know, wired $400 to that woman who said she was my long lost sister. I've already made the bad mm -hmm. choice. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. So go to betterhelp.com and it'll be on your time wherever you are. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and good for you listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash Whitney. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Whitney. Also, please record your session and send it to me so I can listen because I uh, probably have that problem too. Yeah, that's not HIPAA loves that. Here's a list of things I'm not doing: leaving my house, getting my own groceries or <laughs> items from restaurants, um, and so, talking to anyone. So DoorDash works out great for me because they keep me alive. I'm looking through my DoorDash orders. These are my completed orders, and I am not ashamed to say that I order from DoorDash 
uh, sometimes three times a day. Well, they have over <laughs> 300,000 partners in the U.S., Puerto Rico, Canada, and Australia. And you can support your neighborhood go-tos as well or your favorite chains like Popeye's, Chipotle, or Cheesecake Factory. By the way, you can also order flowers and cupcakes on here. But did you hear you can order Popeye's? Because that's, that's key. Uh, yeah, with the Cheesecake Factory. I know how oh, you two feel about that. <laughs> the Cheesecake Factory is important. That's our special place. <laughs> Am I allowed to say this? Are we going to lose the sponsor? A lot of the DoorDash people are fucking hot. For a limited time, our <laughs> listeners can get 25% off and zero delivery fees like, hey, on take their off that first. Mask. Let me see that pretty smile. For a limited time, our <laughs> listeners can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter code Whitney2021. That's 25% off, a $10 value, and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app and enter code Whitney2021. Don't forget, that's code Whitney2021 for 25% off your first order with DoorDash. Subject to change, terms apply. It's also just nice to have someone to talk to these days so true <laughs> i think that was another one moment when i realized that she was going to be my wife is when she was still living in canada she was in vancouver and i went to go visit her on her birthday we got into some dumb argument for some reason i like stormed out of the hotel and i went to the grocery store to go get her some fruit and birthday candles <laughs> <laughs> because I knew she didn't want cake. And I was like, I'm going to stick this fruit in this mango and light this and make her realize that she fucked up because I love her. And that was it. I'm so mad. I'm going to show this bitch how much I love her. <laughs> I hate her so much that I'm going to spend three hours trying to carve. I mean, mangoes are hard as shit. It was difficult. <laughs> how do you feel about change a woman gently suggesting or changing a man's fashion or hair choices. <laughs> Is that toxic and sick? Like, I radically accept the person, but are, do you have to radically accept the person's hair and wardrobe? I think you can make suggestions, mm -hmm. but you can't force them to change it. The, and I think um, what if they overall, have no man wants you to dress them. No man wants you to, like, maybe you can suggest hair things, or you can be like, look at this brand. I like this brand. Yeah. Maybe even show a model and be like, look at this model. I like this. I, baby, I think you will even look better than this guy yeah. in this type of style. Mm -hmm. That could work in their brain. Mm -hmm. But, like, I think, it, like, w one of the things that was not working when I was married in my 20s was that like my wife was dressing me and it wasn't like to make me look nice. She was putting me in floral prints and shit to be like, I don't want you to go out there looking attractive, you know? Is there anything that she does that exes did that it isn't, isn't, it isn't annoying when she does it? Because hmm. I have this theory that we have a lot of this like black and white thinking about like, I hate it when a guy does this, I hate it when a guy does this, or I hate it when a girl does this. But then I'm also like, you know, if it's the right person, that might actually not bother you so much. Um, I, it would be more a general thing of like figuring out what's worked for us. And I always felt like I think even we, we talked about this um, or, or very early in the relationship where I was just like, um, I need to have someone who's like, I'm a comedian. I need someone else who's like a rock star or duh, duh, who's also got just as much going on as me. And, and this, I can't have someone who is like staying mm. home or doing like that. And like that was my mindset before. And my, it's not like my wife is like a stay at home, do nothing, uh, which is it, that's not even the thing. Yeah. If you're staying at home, you're doing a shit ton. Yeah. Um, but my wife is great. Like she, I would call it like she's great writer she's really funny she knows a lot about comedy but she's like truly like the ultimate like supporter like uh -huh. she's really good at making all of my stuff easier mm. as far as like the things i was talking about like well she'll lay out clothes for me or mm. uh, she'll know like oh you have your clothes not clothes she bought for you yeah exactly <laughs> uh, she's like oh you have cordon on monday you have this on Tuesday, uh... so you need to have this outfit here we need to have this dry clean here and those are all things i thought i would hate those are all things I'd be like, go get your own business, leave me alone. So uh, hot. But with her, I'm just like, oh man, you really take, you're making this so easy for me. You're taking care of me. But you're you making me realize this is something like it's about motives. So it's like one girl can put stuff out for you and be like, I'm trying to control you. I'm keeping score. You owe me. And then someone else can do it for fun and for free. 
And it's really just all about motives. Like you can do kind things for people and either try to control them or have them owe you from a codependent standpoint. Like that was my whole thing for a long time. I was like, but I'm being nice. Mm -hmm. I'm helping you. I just got you all these gifts. It's like, well, none of it is worth it if there's strings attached. Mm -hmm. And if your motive is actually to control yeah. me and change me. Oh, that's the thing that my wife and I talk about all the time, though. I go, like, I go, always remind her if we get into these things, I go, look, I go, I love everything you do for me. I appreciate it very much. I go, but the number one thing I need you to do for me is always be kind to me, be sweet to me, talk to me sweetly, because I'm very sensitive. And so, like, you could stop cooking, you could mm -hmm. stop doing all that other stuff if you're just kind and sweet to oh. me. If, you know, so if you're feeling like this is a obligation just stop yeah because i need you to do it with that sense of love in your heart mm. and you know and in general she does you know because she just is like you you know she makes me you know in, in a place where like a lot of people are either like oh you're lazy you're do this you're pothead da, da, da. Like, you're literally the busiest person i know <laughs> i know if people if people uh, look they know yeah. you know but a lot of people don't look and she never but you also like, don't bra you're not like a braggy person either yeah you I'm know never like look at this look at that yeah like i'll just watch a tv show and you'll be on it and i'm like what like he didn't post about that he didn't like brag about it he didn't tell everyone you know what i mean it's just sort of um it's cool Thank you. Yeah, because I'm just be like, this is what it is now. Unless it's like, you know, Chop 420 <laughs> on Discovery Plus. That was one that I post and get excited because I'm like, this is my show, you know? But Tell uh, me how that came about. Did you pitched it. You No, I didn't pitch nothing. They came to you. They came to me. And you actually emailed them back. That's a first. <laughs> yeah. You finally figured out how to follow up on an email. Thank God your assistant is here to be CC'd. But... Uh, I went on Chop. I went on the regular Chop. Just, it all usually comes from me trying to step outside of regular shit you know like it was one thing i learned early in comedy it was like wow it's very competitive here you know it's a little less competitive going on a cooking show and being the funniest person when there's like when i'm with musicians yeah yeah, actors, yeah 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 you know and so our like instead of being like oh, i want to fight to be seen on comedy central or fight to be seen on netflix or whatever it's just like let me pop up all these different food places doing these different things because i want to that's just kind of what I grew up loving, yeah. you know? And God so, forbid us do something that's fun and we're not like competing with a bunch of comics on a game show. Exactly. And ruining our friendships by exactly. trying to beat them. I mean, that was always my thing with At Midnight. I was just like, I don't want to be, I don't want you to be mad at me, but it's still, <laughs> I'm here to win. It was just sort of like the one, the, like I, the one, I became a comedian so I didn't have to compete with other people for points. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I, I am competitive, so I, yeah. I love doing that. But well, it's because you always win. So. Yeah, that was part of it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I know that show was fun for you because you would always crush it. So I went on Chopped. I sucked at it. I don't even know how to cook. So it was just like a fun experience where I learned, and I didn't know how real it was. Like mm. they don't like a lot of those things are fake, you know. And they're like, "Well, here we got this thing for mm. you," but they were like, "No, you better make it." Um, and I just bombed out of it the first round. But I was like, you know, my sweet self and fun and stuff and they always remembered me and then they were kind of this idea for having a spinoff that added cannabis to it and they were like who could we get that loves weed and is funny and Genius. that we know and they were like let's get who wrong. tests well yeah it's not that easy it's, it's it. not that it's, that it's true. you also have to uh check a lot of boxes <laughs> in terms of focus groups and people have to really like you <laughs> Which is kind of my problem. <laughs> um, well, it's not your fault. That was you. We've talked about this. They stuffed you down people's throats, and they was they couldn't have any other reaction but to be like, "Whoa, Annoying hold up!" Him, yeah. You know. If I saw, I always say like, if I saw a bunch of billboards with a girl like like wagging her finger at the camera, she's called like Amanda. I would do forty minutes of jokes about it. Yeah. I mean, I would, you know, that was everyone's reaction was like, "I agree with you." That was. <laughs> Awful. <laughs> and it was at a time when I didn't know, like, you know, um, I, I didn't understand that it, even when you get a job that you're allowed to protect your taste or it was I just thought, like, you're a whore and you do whatever. All these mm -hmm. people in suits know way more than you do mm -hmm. about they know math and science and, and I have to be nice to them so that I'll be able to stay on the air. I didn't realize that your leverage was really your numbers and your testing. I thought my leverage was like this lawyer or this guy that went to school for advertising who's now a comedy executive. Like, I have to get his approval. So mm -hmm. I was like dressed but in a banana gotta, costume. You gotta look, you, but remember, remember, remember when you thought 
comedy club owners and managers were the most important people in the world. Yeah. Remember that yes. feeling? Yes. And yes. then you start getting on shows and stuff and you go, oh, bitch, you don't matter. Mm -mm -mm. Like, I could, I could tell mm -mm. you to go fuck yourself and That's you will right. book me as long as I fill this room. That's right. That's exactly right. And it used to be, please headline me before I can sell tickets, you know? And then, uh, and now it's like, this is my travel budget? <laughs> this is like 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 seventies prices, you know, value jet prices. Like they, they haven't even adjusted, you know, so it's yeah, it's 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 knowing your power and knowing your leverage and also just like a magical thing. I didn't I didn't know how to say no because I thought no meant you're not gonna like me, I'm a bitch, I'm you know, shrill, I'm what all these things because I always I already felt like I was on thin ice. Like mm -hmm. I already, you know, had the imposter syndrome of like I don't deserve this or all that shit. And um but yeah, I mean, I remember being on the shoot for like the billboards and just, you know, dancing. It, like someone like threw me a beach ball and I was like, you know, there's like a, a whole table of props, and, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. and I grabbed the beach ball and I'm holding the beach ball and I just look at this beach ball and I was like, what is it? What am I? I'm like carrot top. I'm like, uh, you know, and I just remember it was like an out of body, a dissociative experience where mm -hmm. it's just like. I just need to do what these people say, which is the opposite of comedy, you Definitely know? following your instincts and what got you to where you are. I feel like we're kind of finally at a place with comedians, maybe a little bit, where it's not like, you're super funny doing that. Now play a fireman, you know? Yeah. It still happens. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm still like, um, you know, just dealing with that as far as like, the, like, oh, do you know my name or do you know my voice, you know? like Fascinating. In so a lot of places, they just hire me because they know my name and then they want to make me do something else. And uh, I'm trying to transition mm -hmm. away from doing stuff like that just because it doesn't feel good. And I, I did a couple of those. I remember doing a show on CBS just because I was like, oh, I want to say I did every network, you know? Yeah. And then I would come home every day and I'd talk to my wife, or who was my fiance at the time, or just my girlfriend at the time, and I'd just be like, I don't feel funny. I go like, mm. I can't tell if I'm funny. I don't know if I'm doing a good job. They tell me I am, but I, I don't know. I can't feel mm. it. Usually I can feel it. Yeah, they're professional liars, uh, professional pretenders. Yeah. Uh, so it's like, Everybody's brilliant. Yeah. So like, you know, like what's going on? And so, um, and, and it's just really still trying to go back to that place where like, at the end of the day, yeah, I need to feed my son, I need to pay these bills, but I need this to be fucking fun. If yeah. it's not fun, if I'm not engaged in it, I'm gonna fucking suck, mm. you know? And I like being a positive. And I even, I, I had this conversation, it was actually a conversation I needed to hear. Is this guy in Denver who has reviewed my, like the first time I did comedy there, he reviewed me and he was like, he did a couple of jokes from the Twitter that he wrote on tweets. And then I was just like, this guy fucking, why are you fucking paying? But then I learned to like him because I was like, this guy pays attention. He's obsessed with you, what do you yeah, mean? You like know, but not just me, like with all the comedy that he saw in Denver, you know, he yeah. would pay attention. Yeah. And he would see it, and when he would write, po whenever he wrote positive reviews about things, it would be about. I was like, oh yeah, I thought I should lean in this direction, you mm. know. And I had a conversation with him recently, promoting this Chop 420, and he was like, man, I really like seeing this for you because I can tell how much fun you're having. I can mm. tell that you're engaged. Mm. He's like, I've been seeing the couple. He was just honest. He's like, I watch a couple of things, and I can tell you're like, you're just doing them. And I was like, I go, I needed to hear that because mm. I've been noticing that. And so I, I needed that to tell me and give me a reason to stop doing those things. Because I was just like, same thing. I was like, oh, I have to do it. I mm. have to do it because if I say no, they won't want me. But mm -hmm. if if I keep saying yes, I'm going to get weird. <laughs> you know, I'm going to get weird and bitter. It's, you know, it's interesting when we talk about comedy so much because I'm always like, oh, God, should we be talking about it? It's so inside baseball and all we're doing is talk about comedy. But it's a metaphor for everyone. I mm -hmm. think it's like everyone's got the same. I think comedians sometimes are like, our job is so special. Like, it's like everyone has a version of this, whether you're, you know, a waitress or, you know, a lawyer. Or you have to speak in front of people, you know, or whatever you do. Um, and, um, you know, to be able to do the job but it not feel like an obligation is such a hard mm -hmm. thing, you know? And, um, cause you have to get that flow state on stage. Like the audience feels when you're reciting it, when you're wrote, when you're just like, you know, being a robot about it. And it'll happen when, if I do like two shows a night and the first one I'm in it and then the second one I'm kind of phoning it in and I'm not getting the reaction I want. And it's like, oh, they feel it. Like 70% like of this is just energy and mm -hmm. it's just sort of like connection with the crowd and you can't check out. Cause I mean, you can, I can fully do a set 
and be totally somewhere else, mm -hmm. you know, and like pull it off. But there's no like connection to the audience. You know, what yeah. I mean? that's the difference between like the electricity. Yeah, that used to be my um, that's what I would do if it wasn't going well. I'd be like, all right, I'm just going to check out. Mm. I'm going to tell my jokes and I'll check out and I'll I'll catch get the check at the end of the night. And then I realized like um, I think it was watching the, the Gary Shanlin documentary about uh, being, you know, mindful on stage where I was just like, you know what? Fuck that. Yeah. You know, if if that's happening, then my thing is going to be I'm going to make sure no matter what, I like this set. I had fun. If no one else, if everybody else fucking leaves, mm -hmm. as long as I at the end of the night went like, oh, I had fun. I made myself laugh. Yeah. I thought of something different. I made, I said something brave mm -hmm. that I, I thought people would hate me for or something. Then I had fun and I loved it. No matter, it's more than like, if, if you know, you know, there's a priest thing or whatever. Like we're killing it. at some point. Killing is easy if you know the tricks and you know, um, you know, not with every audience, obviously, but, but like, but if you know your audience, you know your tricks, you can just start killing. Yeah, you yeah. Know? But it's different to be like, oh, I'm growing. I'm being mindful. I'm um, learning myself. I'm I'm getting just as much out of this as they. I'm actually giving them more because I'm in the moment. And like you said, I don't think that is comedy related. That's any type of like job when you start checking out and you start just being like well i'm just working for the weekend and you're just like well motherfucker like most of the days are the week you know like you should have fun during the fucking week how has doing podcasts changed your live shows um i think it's just made me more uh patient mm -hmm. like that's probably been it more patient more mindful more open to finding things it was actually really helpful for for the chop show um i because i thought it was just like okay i'll tell jokes mm -hmm. and i will use hosting skills um but then i ended up having to use a lot of podcasting skills because um you know, you know these shows you know they, they want stories they want things and i had to be like oh how can i ask the right question to get them to talk to me about what it's been like for them to not work in their restaurant during the whole pandemic or or this guy one guy hadn't seen his father in 12 years how can i a stranger who they just met mm -hmm. while they're also trying to compete for ten thousand dollars how can i ask them that question that doesn't make them go hey you know what i'm busy fuck you you know yes so i had to start to be like you know just figure that out and i think the podcasting of like leaning in of like no of just finding things whether even it's like something on their clothes or something where i'm like oh like tell me about this and then get to like because yeah. my initial instincts is like they told me in my ear like oh that's about the dad tell me about your dad you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that won't work nope <laughs> nope no no but yeah you gotta lube them up a bit guys um and i'm also curious about your audiences like do they expect something different from you when you tour based on hearing you, you know, be so vulnerable and talk about mental health? And like, you know, do you feel like you owe them any of that when you perform live? Um, I don't know really yet. Um, I think some of it is still me trying to mix a bit of it because mm -hmm. I do like I, lo I think my podcast is my like I don't not the most profitable thing I do, but it's definitely my favorite thing to do is my wife's favorite thing that I do. And. I like to bring. You stay home when you do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, she just goes. You actually like you're funny. Funny is great. She was yeah. like, but people will write and be like, you know, I mean, like off of your it's episode. Changed my life. You know, I shared you that message I got off the of your episode where a lady was like, I had to get out of this relationship and I knew I needed to get out, but it, it took me listening to the podcast and listening to the, you talk to Whitney to be like, oh, I can't take this and things like that are like so fulfilling more mm. even more than like any like standing ovation or anything like that so i'm trying to like portray a little bit more of that on stage but also never get to the point where i'm like oh we're here to just this is your safe space and we're here to like no yeah. i'm gonna tell i'm also probably gonna say a racist joke or a sexist joke or something that is you might but go like joke. that's left field yeah you know because but yeah and to me those are fun if you like 
you know me. You know my heart. Yes, you know my heart. That's so, it. So, you know, that's like it. Anthony Jeselnik, right? Yep. You know, like if you know my heart, that's what made, that's why I can call you Ho Rogan. You know? And, and it's also like we're going on this roller coaster ride together. You know, this is like we're, we're saying a bunch of stuff we don't necessarily mean. A lot of it is like thought exercise. And I guess I just, I get a little conflicted because I'm so codependent because. I, you know, I, I was reluctant to do a podcast for so long because I just I just don't think I'm that like I'm just I I'm I would love some tips, um, but I it's 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 very hard. I don't feel like I'm particularly um, there yet in terms of of what I want it to be, and maybe that's just what a podcast is. It evolves as you evolve and as you you know. It's just weird because you're learning in public. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your first episode, everybody hears, and it's like, wait, I've never done this before, you know. And you're learning um, in front of everyone and making mistakes in front of everyone instead of like making all the mistakes. You know, comedy we can practice in private, and then we show mm -hmm. you the final product. This well, that's it. actually even fun because I was thinking about that when you said the Whitney thing in the um, beach ball. Beach ball, because I think I had some similar like lessons, but they were all like smaller scale. So I was like, oh, I'm glad I could learn this now as opposed to when I'm on like some big NBC show. So in some ways I feel like, you know, I don't feel bad. You're rich. But like, <laughs> I'm sorry that that was you having to go Not through from it that, that way. Show. Um, but uh, uh, from the two broke girls. <laughs> <laughs> the um, that's fascinating because um, uh, Shanling actually said to me one time, um, you know, and he said at the right time, the right way, right when I was able to receive it, because I never would have believed it, I think, if anyone else had said it to me. He said to me once, you know, you can never make it too late mm. as a comic. Mm -hmm. The only damage you can do is making it too early, getting mm. seen too early. And I was absolutely seen too early when young women come to me and they're like, how come I'm not getting the spot? How come I'm not on Fallon? How come I don't know? It's like, I promise you, <laughs> like, take it from me. Like, I think I got a couple opportunities I didn't deserve just because I was a girl or whatever. They needed a girl in the lineup. I was seen by Montreal. I was just seen before I was ready, mm -hmm. you know, before I really had a point of view, before I was really comfortable on stage, when I was still trying to make the comics in the back of the room laugh or when I was still um, apologetic and being too dirty for no reason just because I was trying to neuter myself or, mm -hmm. you know, make the open micers you know, laugh or whatever, be the darkest, you know, because that's a lot of times what happens at the comedy store at 2 a.m. is just who's the darkest, mm -hmm. um, who's the, the grossest, who's the, you know, tells like the craziest rape joke or whatever. And I feel like I definitely got a lot of stuff before I was ready and before I knew who I was and before, certainly before I was able to uh, be a boss, whatever that means. I had no idea how to be a leader. I had no idea. I was so concerned with people liking me that I was unclear. And mm -hmm. that's the worst thing you can do in any work situation. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, I love that. I love that. Yeah, yeah. And then you change it later and they're like, you just lied. And it's like, no, I just didn't want you to not like me. And then everyone's like, well, we just had to do more work because you are trying, mm -hmm. we we know you like us. You hired us. Like, <laughs> we don't, we're adults. Yeah, we can handle it. Yeah, more efficient. Yeah, we can handle it. And I was so, um, with people that worked on the show, I was like, well, whatever you want. Like, what do you think? And they were just like, just tell me. <laughs> like, we just want to get out by eight. That, the nicest thing you can do is just get us out by eight. Be decisive and be clear. And <laughs> I couldn't be decisive because I was like trying to, you know, make everybody like me and make them feel involved and empowered. And there's a way to do that without wasting their time and vacillating and, you know, being wishy-washy. And so I didn't have those tools yet. Like, make sure you have your your mental health together before you decide to, you know, or get big opportunities. Like, you know. Um, yeah, it's a war. It's a fucking war. I've been trying to make a show about my son and I for, like, four or five years two coming up on two years with this iteration and um yeah i learned a lot of those lessons i think the first one i was so happy that i was like mad at the time it didn't get picked up yeah. but i was also like this i'm happy to get money to fail yeah that's fun yeah that's a beautiful that's a success thing. in itself um but i was doing a lot of that like oh well what do you want how do you want to do this like with the writing partner because i'm like oh i've never written a show like before so i should listen to you and yeah. what I've been liking them now, whether it gets picked up or not, um, is that it's really been me leading and mm -hmm. being like, this is the story I want to tell. It's about instincts. Yeah. It's not about right experience. Yeah. Even getting arguments with people in Helen the Right Way where they were like, well, he needs to have a passion. You need to, blah, blah, blah. And what if he's an artist, a drawer? And I go, look, I can't draw for shit. Yeah. And I go, and then even my manager would be like, well, you know, it's a show and it can be not, you know, and I go, I go, yes, Damn I get maybe. that. But listen to this. Everything that you guys have responded positively to has been true. So how about we just stick with that yeah. instead of faking it now? Fascinating. And also it's, you know, I'm always stuck between respecting people with experience but also going, you know, 
you have experience in making a bunch of shows that were really relevant before, but the world's changed mm -hmm. and actually the most valuable uh, person in the room is maybe the youngest, freshest point of view or the most authentic point of view. And I always struggle with that, you know, because I put writers that have done a lot of stuff on pedestals, but mm -hmm. I'm also like, oh, you've learned all these bad habits. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know how to just get a script done. Like everything you're pitching was really good when you did it on Will and Grace, but mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> how do we break the, how do we do something different, you know? So yeah. to me, I'm, it, it's the same thing happens in um, like, like medicine or especially veterinary medicine, um, just because I'm dating a, that um is that oh, some I didn't know. Is, yeah oh, i'm that, excited I mean, for this <laughs> this seems right i mean he's also 31 i'm 38 That's weird. i know That's i know fine. it's kind of perfect yeah no it's it's weirdly perfect and i it's it makes no sense but also if makes he all... was under 30 then i had trouble <laughs> you know because i'm like no way but like 31 yeah. that's he, a guy who might be like I want to, you know, get my shit together. Dude, yeah. I mean, older, where there's something, um, you know, I think also. Especially as a vet. Not a 31-year-old comic. But yeah, a vet, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's, he, what nobody tells you about doctors. They're like, date a doctor, date a vet. They don't tell you about, they have student loans until they're in their 40s. Oh, I know. My sister's a doctor. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. They don't start making money until they're in their 40s mm -hmm. and 50s. Yeah, my mom wasn't even. She was like, oh, your sister just paid off her student loans. She's like, I'm so happy for her. She's like, I just never felt it was fair that you had your money and, and you didn't have student loans. I'm like, what the fuck you mean it's not fair? <laughs> you think it was fair when she was graduating college and you were calling me every night going, well, well what's going on with your life? Well, you didn't give a shit if you weren't like oh you're smart then you weren't like oh good good for you for not having student loans then also guess what comedy's the best medicine yeah so i'm actually a doctor yeah. i'm the real oh, doctor I had a in whole the family joke about how i was more powerful than her even though she was a doctor but then covid really <laughs> took the wind out of that sale people weren't responding well to that anymore no 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 <laughs> <laughs> the biggest time, like canceled and canceled coming after the nurses canceled um but uh but sometimes in veterinary medicine and medicine in general the older someone is the less they know about the new technology and mm. the new stuff and they're operating on some old software so i think we have a lot of ageism both ways mm -hmm. you know but there's a lot of ageism against young people when it's like you know especially writers and stuff where everyone's like oh y you know you live this but we know more about how to do it mm -hmm. and it's just sort of like how can you know more about my life my life than I do. Yeah. Just get out of the way. Just get... and that's my thing. Like that's my comedy. That's, way, it's not like I fake my comedy. Here's the good news. You, I'll do all the work. You can go home at two. <laughs> like it's also this thing of like I. It's my experience. Like I'll do all the work, you know. But when ego gets involved and when someone's like a showrunner, they feel like they have to. There's this thing that comedians like have to be babysat. That they have to sort of be um, wrangled or something mm -hmm. because we're too like unpredictable and or something. And you know, I think that's kind of changing a little. Bit yeah, with and I like Donald the Glover collaboration. And you know, I've, I've met some wonderful people. People, I mean, it, it doesn't matter, it'll either get made or not, but um, developing with people at FX now and like just talking to the way They're it great. never makes me feel like she's like, well, oh, we got to change this to fit into our mode or anything. It's more like she'll make me look at the world bigger. She'll make me Love pull it. it out of like just my, out of just my story and go like, okay, well, what's the world view on this? Mm. And I go like, oh, okay, well, that's great. I love these notes. Helpful note. Yeah. That's not, we're not rooting for this character because a lot of executives just say what they already heard. And I and I notice in, the, uh, in this business a lot that when something's successful, everyone wants to replicate the thing that was successful, right? 100%. But um, like after Bridesmaids came out, everyone was like, calling like can you make another bridesmaids can you make the next bridesmaid mm -hmm. and how I, many who does your workaholics take yeah to, and it's also like don't replicate the thing that was made replicate the fact that it was original idea so that's you, what i say so much it seems so easy but i know it's hard but that's not what people didn't respond to it because it was that people respond to it because it was a real world that they got invited to mm -hmm. that's what people respond to with all those type of shows and then they go in and they lean all the way in that direction when it is just like hey just tell that authentic story people yeah. will find it if it's true it will ring a bell to people and they will find it and that's what i've been lucky with the development people have been helpful and but um 
I learned so many of those same lessons in, in trying to find a writing partner for this yeah. because I would meet with people who have written on shows or who have been on big shows and mm -hmm. I'm like excited to meet them and stuff like that and they're telling me like oh this will never work as a show or this oh this is too dark or da -da -da. and then it took me a point where I'm going like oh you don't know Unless it's like, I, and I've met people who've made empires. Uh -huh. I, mean, I know Bill Lawrence. I know yeah. fucking people who, I know the people, the lady who made Chopped, you know? <laughs> I know people who made empires, and those are different. Those are few and far between, uh -huh. and they kind of have visionaries. But sometimes, you just know how to make the shit you made. Yeah. You know how to make the one thing you made. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But that doesn't mean you can tell me. You know what I'm doing. And I'm talking about you, the lady who made the new Avengers of old Christine. You suck. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Wrong. Look, I'm not known for having the most sexually appealing personality on the planet. Wrong. I have that problem too. I'm, 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 you know, I have come to the point in my life where Wrong. I have accepted the fact that if I utter one word during sex, a man will lose Dicks his Dicks go down all over America. <laughs> I fully support. Use these Roman wipes if you need them, because I don't have time to to uh, to maintenance to, you. I don't have time to uh, charm your dick like a snake trying to <laughs> yeah, yeah. get a flute. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have time to cajole yeah. your dick into doing yeah. what it should be doing, I but maybe seen... isn't because you watched too much porn ten years ago. Give <laughs> the gift of boners. <laughs> Roman is discreet. You no go online. No shame in this anymore. Yeah, they prescribe it. It goes right to your door. You don't have to worry about walking in and talking to some other professional about your little pee pee someone prescribes you what you need oh, so maybe it's uh because it's not one this, size maybe fits it's all it's not just for it's like dicks it go to gayroman.com slash whitney now you'll get 15 dollars off your first month it's really time to take care of your ed and remember get started today and you'll save 15 dollars on your first order of ed treatment that's a treat for everyone june shine is like it's like the champagne of kombucha. And it's, look how oh, cute, look how the cute champagne that. of kombucha. Look at the bottles. They're so pretty. It's just the perfect buzz where you're not an idiot. You're not sleeping with anyone's husband. You can still function properly, but it just like takes the Those anxiety away. Very specific away. And I feel no, I feel no <laughs> guilt. I feel no headache the next day. Yes. I don't feel dehydrated and yes. just like I, 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 no migraines. It's just a goddamn treat. It and feels luxurious. It feels like something I shouldn't right. be allowed to have. It's and also... <laughs> Uh, probiotics. Probiotics, gluten free. I am probiotics. Yeah, yes, they right. use green tea and honey opposed to black tea and sugar. And they are committed to being 100% carbon neutral. They donate 1% of all mm. sales to environmental nonprofit. Love. We've Add. worked out an exclusive deal for Good For You podcast listeners. Receive 20% off plus free shipping site wide. I recommend trying one of their best selling variety packs. It's a great way to try all their delicious, delicious. flavors. <laughs> Go to juneshine.com no more for Emily. to use code. Whitney at checkout to claim this deal. That's G U N E S H I N E. June Shine, like Moonshine. That's but it's G June Shine. Just click. Yeah, we got. Oh, okay. For me, just click. That's Dark. G U. J U N E. <laughs> That's okay, J U N E. Guys. S H I N E dot com slash Whitney. June Chine can also be found in over 10,000 stores across the country, including Whole Foods, Safeway, Kroger, and Publix. Publix. Dude, I. There is this new freedom in podcasting where you guys created a very dangerous breed of comedians by pissing us off on sitcoms because now we have podcasts and we don't need you anymore. <laughs> and we can make money without you. And we're just, I mean, I was just saying to my sis, and I was like, I'm making getting more money from doing two at home gigs than I am for these two fucking uh, a movie and a show that I'm guesting on. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I'm you about guys, to say you whatever. You expected us to keep your secrets forever because you <laughs> thought that we were never going to have another platform besides you and it is just was a grave mistake. But um, but I also think, um, and I know I have to let you go soon, I promise I will. I'm just enjoying Okay, you. good. Are you happy? Go okay, I always, I like you. I always feel like I'm keeping people too long. I let you know. Okay, yes, you will. It's so insulting to assume someone won't just go, 
I gotta go. Yeah, you know who did do that so well was Maria Bamford. I had her on my podcast, and I was just about to let her go. So I was like, "It's fine. I respect your time." But then she just goes, "I just gotta let you know. I told my husband I'd have din- we'd have dinner at this time, so I have to go." And I was like, "Oh, I love your boundaries." Oh, I would have just ruined the relationship. <laughs> I did it. Like the I was did Bert Kreischer's podcast for five hours, and my dude had made dinner, and I just he's still pissed. Um, <laughs> uh, I need the approval of Bert who I've known for 15 years um but uh but I also I think that um I'm I'm now seeing so clearly now that I've been able to step away a little bit or just have had so many things go wrong after you know just having like a pilot every year that it was too dark or everyone just kind of wants multi-cam sitcoms from me and if I try to do something dark they're like don't think that's what anyone wants to see from me Mm -hmm. or um too edgy or whatever or um the woman's not likable. I get that a lot. I tried to do a pilot that was a, about a woman that suddenly started making more money than the guy in the relationship, and it mm-hmm. shifted the power dynamic and mm-hmm. how he felt emasculated and was trying to restore the power dynamic, and it That's funny. screwed everything up. And it was sort of based on when I first, you know, started getting successful. Everyone, everyone thinks you have a billion dollars the second you book a job. Mm-hmm. You know, it takes a while to get paid. You know, whatever. And so I found myself minimal. I thought there was a lot of comedy in how I was like, you know, I. Finally got a nice car, but I date a guy and I'd park it around the street so he didn't see it. And I take mm-hmm. an Uber like to the car so he never saw that I drove, you know, stuff like that. Um, and uh, and we had this like amazing chemistry. But then one time he came over to my old house. He lived in, you know, an apartment. And all of a sudden he was like, are those both speakers? Like he was just like, how much you own this house? How many square? Like and then we like never hooked up again. Like it made <laughs> me way less attractive to him. So it was about sort of that stuff. And they were like, oh, this would never happen. Like this isn't relatable. Mm. Like no woman has ever made more money than a man. Like it was, just, <laughs> it was like so insulting to men and women. Like that's the other thing. Sexism usually is like it's just as sexist to the man. Mm-hmm. But um, I think there's 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 so much. Um, a lot of Hollywood writers and producers um, hate their viewers. Like, they think they're so dumb. They think they can't handle a challenging show. They think they don't want to watch something smart. I mean, I can't tell you how many rooms I've been in where it's like, oh, yeah, but, like, the average person, like, Joe Blow isn't going to get this. And it's Mm -hmm. like, you think everyone's just so dumb if they're not a Hollywood writer. Which is a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Like, you're you're contributing to a dumb culture by by saying that, you know, by by living that lifestyle and, and as art that's what you're taught is to write to your audience's utmost intelligence to believe that they're smarter than you yes love it and a lot of you know i don't want to get specific about the college that a lot of these writers have gone to but um it is a lot of like we're smart and people that are either blue collar or working class are dumb and we need to just do this dumb shit and they don't get it you know it's just like that drives me insane and Mm -hmm. it is so like disrespectful i think yeah to our audience even what like and it's been less so with the fx but originally like a lot of it is about you know just me getting sole custody of my son and being Mm. custody of a kid with autism and and then to do that i had to like have this character of of his mom that like leaves and um isn't around and is doing things and they were there was so much pushback of like we can't show a mom that leaves we can't show that that that, that doesn't happen right. and then and i go like no that does happen it happens to so many people but I mean, it happened to me yeah. the exception can be the rule like what are we doing and i know so many there's so many women i know who have such a complicated um history and feelings around Mother's Day because of of, of, of their relationships with their mom and, and it's never brought up. It's, ne- it's always like, no, moms are perfect and dads are stupid. And I just want to be like, no, I want to show this story about a get dad who had to become good yeah. because the mom wasn't around. The mom wanted to be fun. I think it was Amy Sherman Palladino who does Maisel and did Gilmore Girls, I think, who said like, you know, like, things will be equal in Hollywood, not when there's the payment or more, or like, same amount of women and men are writing the same shows. It's when women can be assholes, too, mm-hmm. and uh, can behave like men or men have traditionally done. Because I argue that a lot of the most people attack these shows for being sexist towards women. A lot. I mean, the women, the men are dumb and the women are super smart and super perfect, which is, like, you know, neither's the case. Yeah, it's when you can, to me... We will reach a great point where I can watch a black show that doesn't have to be about a guy who either got out of jail or or slavery related, a black trauma mm-hmm. stru- struggle yep. thing. If uh, uh, if there's a woman comedian that looks like Jay London and she's also <laughs> funny and famous, Jay London. 
London? You guys Google Jay London, please. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm gonna look like Jay. If I kept doing weed edibles, I would. I would have. I was very close to looking like Jay London, just with blue hair instead of brown. There for I was wearing overalls the other day. I mean, I'm. How dare you? <laughs> but you know what I yeah. mean. Like that's always been okay. Yes. You can be like I was talking about this with my wife the other day. But because... then she, he can look like that, or she can look like that, and it's not the A story in every episode. Yes. She just happens to look like that, or the character just happens to be black, and not every story is about. That's not yeah. the only thing interesting about the person. Yeah, just get in the way because. Um... Like me and my wife were talking about, we were listening to some podcast, and the guy was like, and he's talking about his favorite comedians, favorite female comedians. Mm -hmm. And it was all like, it was like you and Nikki Glazer. And it was like, it was all, we were laughing. We were like, oh, no, these are all like, your list is basically, here's the comedians I'd fuck. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and I just really like to get to a point First where. First of all, thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, the, where it's like, but we're very okay with Zach Galifianakis with the, you know, I'm not putting people down. Mm. I'm just saying like it's socially acceptable to be a schlubby dude, but like not necessarily for women all the time when with thing, and, and even so with guys more and more fine. I'm wearing Spanx right now. Uh, but... <laughs> I stopped wearing Spanx when I got fake tits. So oh, it's like nice. a whack-a-mole situation. I will, I will, I'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to follow up with a couple things because I get so excited and, mm -hmm. I, and I jump around. I do want to talk about the tarot cards. Okay. Is this something you do on your own or you have someone do it with you? Uh, now it's something do people do with me. Before, I, um, when, I, when I was my first marriage, my wife was in the tarot cards and stuff. And um, I, that's how I got into it. And it was actually very helpful. My first tarot reading was actually the, one of the first times people, someone told me, they were like, oh, you're going to work in entertainment. You're going to work in com. They go, I was working at a bank at that time, you know? And they and I was just like, oh, you, I didn't even believe in it. I was like, you know, That's skeptic. Funny. And they were just like, oh, you're waiting around for somebody to come save you and and, and tell you you're funny and stuff. Like, it, it seems, and, and it wasn't, again, like you said, the way they said it, it wasn't like, oh, I see this, I see that. It was, they were mad. They read my shit and they were like jealous, you know? They were like, oh, your life's fine. You're fine. <laughs> I'm obsessed with that. <laughs> You're fine. Just stop. Just like, go. Don't do it. Stop wasting my time. <laughs> yeah. Like there's people that need help around yeah. here. Yeah, it was a bit like that. And, um, you know, because I was on the Oregon coast and shit, so it was very easy to get into metaphysical shit. Um, <laughs> so, and then when I got divorced, I... Um, I kind of, I, that was one of the things where I was like, I still want to keep this part of me. I don't necessarily, you can get so addicted and frozen on making decisions because I'm like, oh, is this the right decision? Is this flip. And so yeah. I stopped reading for myself. Uh, but if there is like. Because you can interpret it. Like, yeah. it's like the way you can kind of read any horoscope and make it apply to you yeah. if you really want to. Exactly. Or you can like, well, oh, this must mean this because I want it to mean this. Mm. Um, but now um, I have a, a lady named Danny uh, who will read for me on occasionally. And um, last one was. Like recently during the pandemic, there was like a job. I got a um, audition and for some multicam sitcom, and I was like, I don't want to do it. But then I didn't have anything to do, so I was like, I'll just do it. I'll just do the audition. I'll have fun. And then I, because I was having fun, of course, they were like, of you know course. what? We want you to do the callback. And I was like, you know what? Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I don't want to gum up the works. I actually was just doing it for fun. I don't want to. I don't want the job. I was just trying to waste your time. I was just trying to distract myself no, and practice. I told, no, I told them no. <laughs> I told them no from the get go, you know, and they came back around. Wow. And then I did the audition, and they were like, "Do the callback." Hollywood producers, and don't, and no, like, never means no. Yeah, and then when I told them I don't want to do the callback, and they were like, "Well, what if we just offered it to you?" And then I was like, oh, and I was counting the money, and I was like, "I don't know what my next fucking um, stand up date will be." And it was like, you know, I don't like to talk money in general, but I was like, it was like it was almost a million dollars I was going to turn down, you know, guaranteed money, and I was like. Uh, I maybe want my I own tarot this. card reader named Danny. Yeah, so but I was like, it. but again, I'm working on my shit for my son, and if I was, if I take that, as you know, I can't do both. Okay. So I had to be, be, be like, well, do I take this guarantee, almost million dollars, or do I keep? pushing the thing that I really love and I feel is my calling, mm -hmm. but I've thought other things were my calling and I was fucking wrong. Yeah. So 
Um, and I just read with her, and she was just it was, it was very much like, you could take it, but you're going to hate it. You're not going to have fun. She's like, she's like, just believe in yourself. Just figure it out. You'll be fine. So I turned it down, and um, the show came out. It doesn't look good. So <laughs> Because you're not in it. I mean, it is your career and life and, and personal life is really not defined by what you say yes to, but what you say no to. And I look at all the things that like broke my heart that didn't happen. And I look back and I'm like, oh my God, rejection is God's protection. Like whether you believe in God or not, you know, I love a good rhyme. Um, Who does it just, it just is, you know, these slogans like, and I know sometimes they sound like platitudes or you know, whatever, but they do work because at a time when your brain is overcomplicating something, when you s just keep it simple and say something super simple, it just is, it, 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 it is how you get to the solution. Because my brain can just, like you were saying, the mouse in the maze or whatever it is, it's just like, um, say what you mean, mean what you say, don't say it mean. I say that all the time on this podcast, I know, but it's like there, at times when I want to overcomplicate things, and be like, I have to get justice and I have to set a good example and I can't, I have to, it's just like, say what you mean, mean what you say, like these when you have a complicated brain, when your brain's on fire, sometimes just little platitudes do the trick. Mm -hmm. You know, halt. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Like if you're angry and upset, just halt. Are you hungry? Are you angry? Are you lonely? Are you tired? If Don't you're make any decisions. That's what I do. I never make any decision based off the fact that I'm tired in the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, because I used to. I'd be like, oh, I don't want, oh, I'm so tired. And so I'm, I'm not going to want to do that two weeks from now. <laughs> you know? hundred percent. And like, and like, if it's hysterical, it's historical. I think that's like an alliteration. It's like a little mind trick, but it kind of works and helps me remember, you know, so... I love those little things, even though they might sound like reductionist and you mm -hmm. guys are probably getting annoyed by me. Um, but I want to talk about psychics for a second mm -hmm. because I, it, you with tarot cards is kind of like me with psychic. I used to go to the psychic and I don't know if I even believe in psychics. Like I'm sure, I think we're all so deeply psychic mm -hmm. and intuitive, but we've really disconnected from our source Absolutely. and we've learned to doubt ourselves and, and go, well, you're being rational, you're being emotional, you're being judgmental. Like we really. No, I know I have a strong intuition. I've always done. That's one thing my mom said about me. Like mom was in an abusive relationship for like over a decade and she's just like, She's like, I should have just, she's like, you had the, you and your sister just had intuition from the moment you met him. You're like, this guy's not a good guy. Wow. This isn't a good person. I can't explain why. I, I can't write an essay about why, but it just doesn't pass the smell test. And I think we dim our superpowers a lot. Mm -hmm. um, no, you don't listen to those intuitions when you don't follow. That's what is getting you as far as you've gotten, you know? And um, I think for me, a lot of it's been through like getting back into exercise, getting back into diet that um, allows me, because you know, a lot of it is just being toxified, you know, to that uh, ruins our intuition from us. I'm a firm believer in that, you know, when you're on stage and you're truly killing and you're kind of in that middle zone, in that flow state mm -hmm. where you're in, not in any time, mm -hmm. you know, when you're like, when you're in the present future and the past, when you're like saying something in the moment, when you're clocking the audience for your next joke or for the moment, and you're analyzing how that joke went in the past, you kind of then kind of learn that like, oh, there's more here, yeah. you know? Um, I can I don't know how to explain that unless you know. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's if you, you know, and I think that we're such a verbal species, and and this why I like like working with animals so much because. Um, it's so nonverbal and it's about like energy exchange. And I think we're so, um, uh, you know, negative about that. Like, I feel this from this person, like, you know, has mm -hmm. been a stereotype as you're like dumb and ditzy or something, or like do too much ayahuasca or whatever. But um, the reason I, uh, I'm going to this is, is that when I went to the psychic, you know, I was like, oh my God, this woman is so psychic. And I'm sure she is. And, you know, I'm not, I'm sure some are and some aren't. Like some comedians are funny, some aren't funny yet. You know, everyone in their job, you know, there's always a spectrum of how uh, qualified people are for any job, I'm sure. So, um, but this woman, I realized that it was like the way I was saying so something, whether she was psychic or not, she could tell everything she needed to know by the way I was saying mm -hmm. something. So, you know, she'd be like, so what's going on with, um, uh, what do you want to know about your love life? And I'd be like, you know, I... Like, I, I really like this guy, Jason, but, like, I don't think it's, like, I just don't know if we should be together or not. Like, I already said everything. And then she's like, it's not a right fit. And I'm like, you're psychic. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, you, you just started cringing and bending over and, like, going into a super dubious state about this person. Like, you just told me everything I need to know. You know, so it was, like, a kind of interesting lesson. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I went to her 
whether she was psychic or not, who knows? Um, but because she was just like a mirror to my own, like I knew it all. Mm -hmm. I knew everything in mm -hmm. my cells, but I needed someone to tell me what I already knew. That's my favorite knowledge, usually. That's why I find myself, it's not like something I gain from reading a book or learn, watching things, or I mean, I love traveling, but I find like the, my favorite knowledge is some of the things that you kind of unlock within yourself that was always there. Something that was there from before you were born and you're like, oh, this is, I think that's what like, when I f truly feel like I'm getting better at comedy and sometimes the comedy story has been great for that because just because of the things you talked about, it be like how dark it can be when I'm like, oh, if I can go out there and just still be fucking me and I don't have to change who I am and whether it kills or not, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to be me and get, and that used to be my favorite thing is to show the comedy store and I'd watch a couple before, especially if it was like real bro -y comics. Yeah. And I'd watch the audience and I'd see the guys like this huh, and I'd see ladies kind of like checked out and then I'd do my set and like halfway through I'd see it, you know, not that I'd want that, but yeah. I'd see the reverse start to happen. I'd see ladies perk up and be like, oh, I kind of like this. And I'd see guys being like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, you know? yeah. And I'm a, and I was like, I like this. I like, you don't know what this is. I'm changing this for you. And it makes me happy. I just think, yeah, following your intuition and believing it is very important to just follow your gut. And I think we are often taught to get away from that, but it's the best thing that can serve us. It's, it's, um, unless you're just falling, you're just fearful for fear's sake, yeah. but you know, it's there to protect you. It's there to guide you. And when, when people are telling you to get away from that, it's just because they want to guide you. They mm -hmm. want to control you, you know? And the idea is that people, it's also our job to be brave and courageous and to say things no one else will say or make arguments no one else will make as a thought exercise just to like get us out of our, you know, herd sheep mentality. But it's also our job to be super original. It's to, to, to change the energy, you know, um, in the room. And when people are like, that's a weird take. And it's like, yeah, that's, I hope so. I hope no one's had this take before. You know, yeah. I the last thing I wanted someone to come up to me and go like, yeah, you're just like this other, you remind me of this whenever someone says that you're just like fuck yeah or, you know or this reminds me of that person and you yeah. know i never want to be fighting for the best version of the same joke why you know? so well put so well put and you know in this when i was thinking about your show um i meant to uh bring up the chris rock quote of the more specific you are the more universal you are actually mm -hmm. you know and i always forget that because like ah everyone's doing airplane jokes food okay i gotta do the airplane joke food you know or joke or whatever and then it's just like no it's like everyone else is doing that i didn't think anyone wanted to hear about like what it was like to be a woman or like, you know, and, and there's still things that I'm like, no one wants to hear about that. And mm -hmm. it's like, that's probably the thing you should talk about, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So I lean, lean into is either like, oh, that embarrasses me. I don't want to talk about it. Oh, well, now you got to talk, talk, talk about it. That's the thing you got to talk about. got to talk about it. Can I ask you what shows um, you like or what you were watching in quarantine? Shows, movies, anything? Oh, of course. New Easy. you discovered? I told you already. <laughs> 90 Day Fiance, <laughs> pro wrestling. <laughs> did you discover anything new? Like, um, did you rewatch? I rewatched a lot re of things. Breaking Bad, that was fun. I think my favorite things I watched in quarantine, um, I really like, I just like going through and watching old sitcoms with my wife. So, mm. like, we watched all the Living Single, and that was really good. Watching so Martin, good. you know, because she's so Canadian white that it's fun to, like, be like, well, you haven't seen this or that, or, or I haven't seen, seen this. She had seen Martin. I don't think she had seen Living Single. I have, uh, this might, whatever. I, I still think Martin's the best sitcom. I think it is not. I mean, you the might funniest. be right. The funniest. You might be right. It's the funniest. Last but, per. Because I'm thinking favorite. Sorry, my favorite. Funniest. Yeah, it probably is the funniest. And I also argue Ellen, uh, the sitcom. Oh, Ellen's great. Was sitcom. was a very very good. And going back and watching it again, you're like, oh, there's some shit here that I missed the first time I watched it. I like Ellen. I like Grace Under Fire. I'm a big into um, old Christine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't like the show either. <laughs> <laughs> NBC's Whitney. Um, to work up. Um, but yeah, I, I went back and watched a couple movies that didn't hold up. <laughs> like, did you go back, back and watch any old movies where you're like, oh. We're not big movie people. We'll watch multiple episodes of 90 Day Fiance. or watch three hours of wrestling, but a movie, a commitment. that Because I'm not going, because I knew it on a show I can pull out at 20 minutes, 30 yeah, yeah, minutes. Yeah. I got the gist. On a movie, if I don't watch it till the end, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you could I didn't turn it off, but, but then I'm gonna miss it. Yeah. I don't know. We tried. We watched. Um, I mean, our favorite uh, again. I would say the bad trip. Fucking like 
classic. Instant, instant classic. Instant classic. You know, you know what's weird? I feel like it took a second for that to. I feel like I remember when that was shooting, and I was like, "What is taking this so long to come out?" And uh, and I guess the pandemic or whatever. Yeah, it was. that would it be came a part out of the perfect it. time. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what is taking you so long? Oh, I right, think that's people are dying a from a deadly virus. Beautiful that's right. movie, and it's such a. Um, as we both know, Eric, it's such a like. That's what we were talking about. We we're like, wow, that he, and it's probably because you know they've worked together for so long, uh, but. That's his voice. Mm-hmm. That's his voice is this beautiful, kind chaos yes. of like my favorite thing from the opening of the movie when he's busted through the house and he stops to open the door for the lady. And I go, I just look over at my wife and I go, that's fucking Eric. That's- 100%. That's Eric to a T. And I was like, That's, this movie is amazing. That, and and to me, like watching a movie, you know, it, that, that one obviously hits, it, it succeeds at every, you know. But even when I see something that doesn't resonate with me, like I've seen a couple movies that are like winning Oscars and stuff. I'm like, as long as you made the movie you wanted to make, mm-hmm. I like this movie. Mm-hmm. To me, the definition of a successful movie now is that the person that made it got to make the movie they wanted to make and watching that with eric i was like dude you made the you did exactly what you set out to do you did not compromise one bit and um that adds more joy even more joy for me yeah it's beautiful because i had just been talking to my wife i go i don't know when the last time i saw a comedy movie yeah. that it made me happy that made you that yeah, made me laugh, laugh, laugh it laugh, didn't laugh, feel laugh. forced and cringy and... yeah that wasn't like oh some studio uh, i go I was like because my thing was like here's my uh you know my Every comedy movie I've seen in the last 10 years is just throwing a weird object at a woman's head. <laughs> What's the weirdest thing we could hit her in the head with? That's Fine comedy. Fine, dick. Fine. <laughs> that is so funny. Did you see the Woody Allen documentary? No, why would I watch that? Okay. <laughs> To jerk That's off. again another one of these things I don't <laughs> understand. I don't like. I want more fucking fun black stories and stuff instead of like, oh, why? Uh, you just like, no, let's get another white serial killer thing. <laughs> Some of let's known. find out more about John Wayne Gacy. <laughs> it's so That's true. what we need. It's so true. The fuck? <laughs> Give me a fucking show. <laughs> we already know about those motherfuckers who murder people. I ain't murder nobody. <laughs> I had a fucking viral tweet recently and zero women commented about sexual assaults that I did. You know how rare that is in my business? Give me my fucking show. You're like one of the only people who you do, you guys don't have to worry about like a skeleton coming out of the closet later. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, <laughs> You are the safest person to give millions of dollars to right now. <laughs> give it to me. <laughs> but no, let's do the Ted Bundy tapes. Yeah. We have 90 documentaries about. You know what? Zach Efron wants to play him. Let's make a scripted version. Yeah, that's what the, the people want. Let's put one of the most beloved actors on the planet to play Ted Bundy. I kind of like Ted now. <laughs> <That's> so weird. <laughs> let's fix Ted's reputation. I mean, yeah. he's had it too hard for too long. They will. Re- it's easier. <laughs> To get your reputation together as a white serial killer from the 70s and 80s than it is as a black man pulled over today. That's weird. It's so dark. <laughs> it's so sick. <laughs> um, I love you so much. I love you too. That did feel like a good exit. <laughs> more to say but i don't know if i'm like so any any favorite so- jams any favorite song? like i don't i think it's a wrap like i don't really I, I i don't feel like we can go back to small dog <laughs> no it's just kind of i uh just like hate myself yeah i'm just ready uh to go cry um your podcast is uh Inc- getting better everyone like it is so healing it is so um medicinal it's like free medicine. Nice. Get oh, better. Man. Your voice is so soothing. It's I even like listening to you uh thank the people that help support the podcast. I don't think when you're like Jenny in Michigan, uh hope you're having a great day. It's just like it's just like I it's did you ever hear Prairie Home or it's it's Mr. Rogers in a way. Mm-hmm. I Yes. Yeah. It is. It's on purpose. Yes. Hundred <laughs> percent. 
Oh, so that I'm not a genius for no, making that association. No, no, but you know the you're the only person who bring it up, so you kind of you're still for sure. Yes, I won. Yeah, no, um, that's part of a real like another conversation. I was like, oh, you're he's like you're just kind of like Mr. you're a Mr. Rogers. Rogers who curses and smokes weed, and that's okay. Which was my only problem with Mr. Rogers as a kid. Yeah. I was like, can you curse and smoke weed and wear cooler clothes yeah. and not be like white um, <laughs> but in, mixed with like a little prairie home companion you know and you also something that is so fun for me to listen to is when um, you'll be like uh, I was going to ask you a question I forgot what it was anyway um, which that to me is someone walking the walk of what they're saying like you'll just be like oh I forgot what I was going to say and, that, and like when you say that, like you just, I was just listening to an interview and you did that. You're like, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Anyway, so what do you think about this? And I'm just like, oh God, it gives me permission to be able to say stuff like that. Like you're walking the walk and you're modeling the behavior and not just analyzing and talking about it. Yeah, well, it's um, it was truly about like actually starting to listen instead of being like, oh, I have this one question. And then when you're done with that answer, I have this question ready. And so it started to be like, okay, I have one question and then I'll listen. And if it makes me remember my question, great. If it made me lose my train of thought, that's fine. I'll say that. And then I'll go where your, your, your answer led me mm. as opposed to me trying to be like, you know, I'm not a little fucking Larry King, rest me, rest in peace. I'm not anything. I'm just like, oh, I can listen and I'll follow along. And I think it's... um Abandon the plan yes. if something else comes along. And exactly. I, I I, feel like I have this plan. I have questions written and I'm like, okay, so you just said something super interesting. Can you stop? Because I have a board question <laughs> uh, that I wrote four days ago. I can't even read it. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like I had to stick to some script and listening to you going like, oh, no, just allow it to go where it's going to go and stop trying to control it. Uh, and like scripted and um, get all your super interesting questions. You know, like it just, listening to your podcast is just a dream. Thank you. I really like it. I mean, I really like just talking to comedians and actors or whoever, wrestlers, uh, about um, just the constant grind of things and the constant search of getting better and how it's like very similar in so many ways and that, uh, uh where none nobody ever feels like they made it at any point you know mm -hmm. and to f to find that out and to talk to these people and get all this free advice is very helpful for me uh cuz i take a lot of that advice you know and then to be able to give it to other people is just kind of like you said i'm trying to do things that I would have wanted, mm. you know? Because when I wanted to make a podcast, I was like, well, there's a million fucking podcasts. I'm not going to go out there. I hate topical, so I'm not going to fucking talk about the, yeah. the week and review. Yeah. Um, I can't, don't want to have a partner. I don't want to, you know, I was like, I'll just talk about the things I did with my son. Like every morning with my son, getting up to school, I wake him up and I go, you're strong, you're kind, you're brave, but you go out there and be a good guy. And I was like, oh, like I never talk like that in comedy. Like, mm -hmm. let me bring that out to people. And, you know, and I just thought like, and it happened where I was like, oh, my comedian friends will make fun of me. They think, or they'll think I'm trying to like become some self-help guru or some shit. And it's just like, no, I just, these are the things I like talking about. These are mm -hmm. things I talk about at home. These are things I talk about with my wife. Things I talk about with my real friends. You know, and part of the reason I think it, to me, part of the reason I was so scared to do a podcast with me, I was like, like I'll just feel like I'm bombing for three. Like I always mm -hmm. just feel like I'm bombing for three hours, but it's not. That's my shit because I only think I'm valuable when I'm entertaining or useful. Like yes, I, that's yeah. I. Oh, I'm the person that goes to a party and it's like, do you need help? Do you need? And I'll just start cleaning up because I'm like, no, I'm only valuable if I'm useful or have a gift or am being. Do you need water? I got no, but I got double story. I got love enough. Yeah, that's one of my um, when I get maybe like a younger comedian on my podcast, and I'll know like like because you know it's just a different format. So mm -hmm. I'm like, no, we're just gonna talk, and and but sometimes they'll come in and they'll be like, joke, ready, joke, and if I don't, and I'll and I will purposely not give them anything. I won't laugh, mm -hmm. and I'll just be like, okay, well, tell me more about this. You know what's going on with you that makes you think you need to yeah. tell jokes Why are in a you? room yeah. with me and my producer because yeah, we're exactly. uncomfortable. Yeah. Why are you? I go, uh, or I'll just straight up. I go like, well, you know, I, I go, I know you're deflecting right now, but I really do want to know the answer to this question. Thank God I didn't go on your podcast any <laughs> any sooner than last year. <laughs> that would have not. That's why I rescheduled so many times. But I that knew I was couldn't. another thing with my wife as well. Is that I did that. I um, I would like try to 
joke around mm. or like be like like oh I need to show you that I'm funny or I think one of our biggest first fights is like she was telling me some story and I was like and I just go oh that's boring and she was like what and I was like oh I'm joking I'm like uh, I was trying to turn it around and she's like she's like look like I don't need you to entertain me. I'm with you because I like being with you. Mm -hmm. And if I want you to listen to something, just listen. You don't have to turn it into a joke. You don't have to uh, uh, look for a hole to poke into it. Mm. You can just be here. That's what I loved about finding this is like, wow, here's another avenue, whether it's stand-up, podcasting, or whatever, where I can truly be me. Mm -hmm. And it will attract the people who it will attract. And that's one thing I love about my podcast is that I'll get people who like, man, I love it if I'm great. And I'll get people who will go like, oh, I thought this was the corniest fucking shit. I hated your fucking affirmations. But I happened to stumble across one on Instagram on my back on a I was having a bad day. And it hit me and I go, oh, now I get it. Now uh -huh. I see the value in this. And I, now I'm fucking, now I'm listening every week. And I'm like, okay, that's great. That's what I'm here for. Mm. I'm not here for everybody. I'm not here to even, I don't give, fucking give a fuck yeah. about everybody. I'm here to find the people that need this. I love you. I love you. I always end these very awkwardly. That's fine. You, I feel like, have a very elegant way that you end your shows. Thank you. I love you. Glad that you listen. That makes me happy. It really is like one of the few podcasts that doesn't like stress me out. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't feel like anyone's getting hurt. I don't feel like anyone's being made fun of. I don't feel like there's any low hanging fruit. Like, there's no like, ugh. Like, that's, you know, that was unnecessary. Or, ooh, that was that about me? Like, it's just like yeah. a lot of podcasts are just sort of like, um, um, funny and great but sometimes they make they bring out they reinforce some old patterns and beliefs and yours like i never i never listen to it and i'm a worse person after <laughs> <laughs> just saying i'm never like oh yeah i can fucking just slam it you know it makes me be like oh god i gotta evolve like it makes me in a good way get inspired to like dig into the nooks and crannies and be like yeah i still um i still have more work to do in that area or like ah. yeah we all do yeah we all do. It's constant, but then what if you did and then you'd be, be like, oh, time to die. Yeah. You know? Like, it just makes me be like, I, I get excited to get better instead of daunted. Be like, I have so much work to do. It's like, no, no, no. I, like, I can do this, you know? Yeah. More opportunities. Not a burden. More opportunities. And you also speak in a way that gives me vocabulary to be able to say it to other people and, uh, like, in a way that isn't shitty, you know? So I, <laughs> I, I find myself just being like, you're a fucking mess. It finds myself being like, look, like, it, every now and then you can, when you're hurt or in scared, like, it, it helps me uh, stay patient, you know? Thank you. That's a beautiful compliment. I love you. I love you too. You're a good friend and good person. Did, thank you. I'm going to receive that. I didn't argue with you. Good. Why would you? I have some stuff for your wife. Nice. Um, and uh, uh, don't ride elephants. That's always how I end this. Oh, and nice. anything else you want to say, say it. Well, watch Chop 420. Watch uh, Golden Arm, the movie I'm in. That's also it looks good. Uh, Mary Holland, Betsy Sidero, Eugene Cadero. Oh, wow. Real fun people. It's wow. going to be good. And then it's when does it come out? April 30th. Oh, where? Just anywhere? Uh, theaters and on demand. Nice. Yeah. So, just, so I just Google it. I'll just Google things. Google it. And then it'll tell you what network. Everyone's like, what Google network? Just Google Golden it. Arm. Yeah. And watch Chop 420 on Discovery Plus. Watch it so we can get the plus off that bitch. And then. <laughs> 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 that is so fucking funny shit. I love you. It's Ron Funches. <laughs> <laughs>